All right, it's Tuesday. Braun, Straczynski, and Kipnis with us today. Kip, do you see uh, the new winter merch? I do see. I see a nice hoodie you got on there mm-hmm. in yeah. warm in Florida. In Florida. It's cold down here right now. <laughs> yeah, dude, I woke Florida up it was cold. in the 40s. That's freezing for Look at me. I mean, I'm in like a winter hoodie. Is it 40s oh. this morning? It was this morning when Oof. I left. Yeah. So anyway, foulterritoryshop.com. You were still tucked into your bed, sucking your thumb. I do do that. <laughs> yeah. You saw that? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, foulterritoryshop.com. Um, I want to actually just get right into it because we have multiple moves to cover before we get to Ken Rosenthal in a little under 15 minutes. So let's start with Jorge Polanco moving on over to Seattle to help that offense that struggled last year. I mean, technically some people are, it was like a mid offense, but meh, they needed a lot more to be a playoff team. So Polanco goes to Seattle. The twins get Anthony DiSclefani, Justin Topa. Here it is. Darren Bowen, who's a lower level prospect. And Gabriel Gonzalez is actually more of an upper level prospect. There's some money being exchanged. It sounds like Minnesota is saving about six and a half million dollars because there's money being sent over from Seattle. Plus Polanco this year, if you include the buyout, is making eleven point two five million dollars. He has a club option for next year. Anthony DiScalfani making twelve million dollars. So thoughts? Mm. I mean, what are the twins doing? Again, it seems like they're getting rid of a lot of good players. They're cutting money so that they but can use it money, elsewhere. they're cutting money, but... They're broke. <laughs> they're, <laughs> the off season. they're broke. They're so broke. I mean, the pull ads are, are worth billions and billions of dollars. Yeah, but, like, think about it. You're coming off a playoff season. Mm-hmm. They just announced they got 97% season ticket renewals. Mm-hmm. Okay? But they don't know if they're going to get them throwing an arbitrary number out there. 40 million or 45 million on their TV deal. So they're broke. Yeah, they sound like they're broke. Mm-hmm. Oh, but I, I will say this, though. Here's, here's Who my... was playing second base for them? Well, Polanco was hurt last year, though. I understand, but where is Edward Julian going? Well, I don't know. but it... Second base. So they last year they, they DH Polanco a little bit. They used him at first a little bit here and there. They bounced him around a little bit. I mean, they're counting on Royce Lewis being healthy. Yep. They're counting on Correa being healthy. Yep. They're counting on Kirilov taking the next step at first base, right? They're going to use Farmer a lot, and they're going to put Julian at second base. Now, Polanco was a really good player for these guys, and he got some huge hits for him over the years. So it's a little bit surprising to see them get rid of him. But again, and they got money in the trade. So you know what that does for Mr. Polad? Yay, I got more money to sleep on at night. They promised they would spend it. On what? Better popcorn machines? Maybe a low-end starter, a reliever. Do Sclafani eat some innings? Maybe someone else eats some innings? Because they did lose some innings out of that starting rotation. I mean, Sonny Gray had a top three Cy Young year yeah, this I know. last season. They the let American him walk League. and didn't even try. No. Way too out of their price range. Right now, you're looking at Pablo Lopez, Joe Ryan, Di Sclafani's in there, Bailey Ober, and a battle for the fifth spot, Louis Varland, among others. Hmm. I so, just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you're not thrilled. It's, it's interesting... It's just interesting to me because the Twins could take this division easily if they just spend a little bit of money. It's like it's like nobody in the Central wants to win the division right now. Nobody in the AL Central. Your Guardians, Kip, they don't want to win the division. They haven't signed anybody. The, the White Sox are low-end, bottom-feeding right now. The Royals are trying a little bit. The Tigers have done some stuff. But the Twins, a team with the, clearly the best roster going into the offseason, have nickeled and dined it. It's kind of – if I'm a Twins fan, I'm a little bit concerned. I'm with you. I think uh... – Normally in most divisions, you'll find at least one, two, if not three teams that are projected to finish near the top that are all competing for a top spot. The Central doesn't have that clear-cut winner. If you were to pick one, it might be those twins, so you should see all moves that would be going for it. Rarely do you find where you're just the lone team that looks in a position to win the division. So the trade doesn't move the needle for me too much for either team. Um, I think the twins are making this trade out of position of – Luxury, the fact that they have the depth to be able to make this trade to save some money, I guess, with all their players around. Uh, but I, I I think this more is a, a catalyst trade for another one coming for either of them. I think this is a clearing space or clearing room so they can make one more. I think Seattle's close to done. I mean, Polanco is going to be probably in the middle of their lineup, mm-hmm. right? When he's healthy, he's a good player. He's yeah. a great player, player when he's healthy. healthy. He's, he's, and he's... he's 
Uh, you can move him around a switch hitting infielder. You can play most of the positions. He's a, he's a useful guy to have on that team. And when he's right, he's an impactful bat. It's just, you got to get him on that field. Agreed. Uh, Seattle what's improving the, themselves here. The, I mean, Seattle, like, a good reliever. Seattle like, and we would make fun of the 54% thing all the time, but yeah. they like do like these little tiny improvements. They never go, we're going to full splash it. Because they are working, same thing, off a very strict guideline budget. So Jerry DePoto has to do this. He has to nickel and dime and improve incrementally. I mean, that team, we're looking at it right now on the screen. I mean, that team's okay. Is Can the it, offense better than last year? It's definitely a different looking it's offense. It's a different offense. Um, I guess. I mean, Garver helps yeah. for sure. Polanco helps for sure. Julio's not going to have as bad of a first half as he had last year, and that's kind of put him behind the eight ball to start. Raleigh's yeah. a good player. France didn't have a great year last year. Rayleigh, I really like him and left. They brought back Mitch Hanniger, like Seattle's favorite son. So, I, I mean, listen, are, but is it good enough to compete with the Rangers and the Astros? That's the question. And I know they lost last year on the last day, but is it good enough? I mean, their starting pitching is pretty solid. Now, why don't they trade some of their prospects to the White Sox for Dylan Cease? Like, they could trade Miller. They could Woo. trade Wu. They could trade Gilbert. They could trade Kirby. Kirby. They're not prospects. All Those for Cease, and it'd be a perfect pitching. trade. Yeah, young, young, controllable. I'm all for that. Jerry, you make that trade tomorrow. You like to trade everybody. Make that trade. That I way, that, was that way, you know what? You would get – you give away four, and you'd get a five. So that means it's 54. So, you know. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> figure this out. They yeah. have a great young starting rotation. I uh, uh, agree. They probably do. the best – Top to bottom rotation in baseball right now. Would you agree? One through five? One through five, depending on who the fifth guy is, yeah. Well, Miller and Wu are the bottom two. Castillo? Castillo's good. Kirby? Kirby. I think they're both ones. Gilbert? Gilbert could be a one. He's at least a two. And then Miller and Wu. Yeah. And Dylan C's for Miller and Wu. I no, mean, there you go. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Kip, just to. Rem- uh, just to you trade their fill five. You, you trade your five for a four. You're moving on up. See, Jerry, see how this works? I think their math's a little more. But it's, that's 54. In depth, it's always got to you know? be a five and a four. Kip, there was a rumor, I think Nightingale put it out, that the Mariners had a combo with the White Sox about Dylan Cease. And a lot of yeah. Mariners fans, especially, were like, what? We don't need that. Why, why are we going to do that? And they were like, oh, maybe they'd trade young starters. I mean, it, nothing, to, nothing to do with Cease. I, I love Cease. It just doesn't seem like the team that would be the fit for him. I agree. That's not the uh, – unfortunately for AJ and his Sox, I don't think that's the team that will be pulling the trigger on that one. I, I, no. I said that yesterday when Bob Nightingale reported that. That wasn't a, that wasn't a, a realistic thing. That, was, no. that seemed like the White Sox putting it out there that there's another team interested so other teams would be like, oh, no, the Mariners are interested. We better up our ante. When in reality, that didn't seem like a, a realistic fit. No. Um, by the way, Blake Snell's not signing with the Mariners. There's still a lot of talk. I think it's mostly from fans. They'll like come up with ideas and be like, and then we sign Snell because he wants to be here. I'm like, stop. I mean, even if he doesn't get what he thinks he's going to get, the Yankees, if we believe that, offered, what, 6 150 Do you think the Mariners will match that? Hell no. Oh, hell no. Hell no. So I, I do give credit to the Mariners. They're going with a very different look. To me, this is, I dated someone. We had a bad breakup. I'm going to completely switch it up. They had power. They struck out too much. So I'm going to the completely other direction. Uh, Polanco strikes out a lot. I'm saying their lineup in general, though, will have less swing and miss in it than it did last year. I mean, a little bit. It's hard when you trade Suarez, who like led the league in strikeouts the last five years. And Teoscar. Teoscar strikes, strikes out, out a lot. lot. Garber doesn't strike out a ton. No. I don't know. It's it, It'll be interesting to see how this plays out for the Mariners. I mean, listen, you know, Jerry DePoto is not afraid to make the moves. I give him credit. I wish he could. I wish the Mariners every once in a while make the big splash, but they haven't so far, and uh, go from there. This was the time to do it. Agreed. Yeah. For, for the Twins, I will say this. I'm a fan of Edouard Julian. His defense needs work. They clearly believe that he can stick at second base. I think he is going to be a fantastic offensive player. He already has been. I mean, this past season, he was great. So they said, we don't really have a full-time spot for Jorge Polanco. They could use another bullpen arm. They get one in Justin Topa, who's coming off a great season. They get an upper echelon prospect who we'll learn more about in just a moment as J.J. Cooper has a little breakdown for us that we'll run at some point. So I think for the Twins, 
I understand where they're coming from. They looked at a log jam and said, okay, we can get something for this guy and we can save some money to use elsewhere. They need to fill innings in their rotation. I don't think they're comfortable with what they have right now. Okay. Uh, fair? Fine. Fair, 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 fair assessment. I mean, I, I mean, I wish they would have brought back Sonny Gray if they were really trying to go for it. But, I mean, Disco Fani's a nice pitcher. Topo will help him in the back end of the bullpen. And if Gonzalez pans out to an outfield prospect, they need in. Guess what the biggest news for the Twins was? Byron Buxton said he's going to play center field. He's back. Did you say the Twins fest? I'm back. I'm back. Uh, we'll see. I hope he is because he's great when he's out there, but he hasn't been out there very much. He hasn't played center field since I think it was August of 2022. I know he didn't play last year at all. No, he did not. And Correa had the plantar fasciitis mm-hmm. most of the year. I think he's going to have a better year. He looked great in the playoffs, but I think he's going to have a better year. Do you think Correa regrets signing there now? No. No? Why do you say that? Well, he signed a long-term deal, and they're just like, we lose Sonny Gray, now we're trading away Polanco. Now we're just, it's like. I think he knew what he was signing up for. You think? So, yeah, that, that payroll's going to be Kip, in the 140 range. Kip, if you if you signed a long-term deal with a team, and you're like, all right, we just won the division, we're, we won the playoff, we won a playoff round for the first time in 20 years, are we uh, are we going for it? And they're like, no, we're tra- is that, is that kind of the trade-off, though? You sign that big deal, and you know your team's going to be a little bit handcuffed just by you? Is is that the case? I mean, he signed I mean, for well, significantly I mean, less than he was going to get from San Francisco and from the Mets, remember? Be that as it may, AJ is right, where it's like you're not pumped just to see the team kind of not go for it, especially when we just talked about how it's probably their clear division to win. Um so you wanna you wanna go there not only because it's the great deal for yourself, but for a great deal as a team and to win there. And one thing worked out, the deal worked out. But now when they start trading away guys, especially at the top of the rotation, guys like Sonny and some other pleases, uh you you just some your ears start to perk up a little bit. Like you start questioning what are we doing here and uh you're hoping there's some moves to follow this these other ones, I guess. With that being said, who's the best team in the AL Central? Is it not the Twins? I mean, it's still the Twins. They should be the heavy favorite. But they should the be. Twins. But they should be head and shoulders above everybody. They could have had the opportunity to be head and shoulders above everybody else. But this is an ongoing disease in our game right now. Is you wait for this moment as a team, right? Most of these teams went through pain for their fan bases, where there were multiple years of garbage. And then all you expect is when you're at this point, you're going to push some chips in, and you don't care if you're going to take some chips out later on, right? It's just that's not how the game is operating right now. And I do think it has a lot to do with the team on the other end of this trade. It's it's 54%. I, why why do the push in and then the push out when you can kind of just hang around, hope that dude stay healthy and be the next Diamondbacks? I think it's kind of similar to our, uh, my first years in Cleveland. I think with the way this division is scattered right now, I think the Twins will probably be in first at the All-Star break anyways. And I think they can go kind of see what holes they have and then go out and get that piece and fill it in later down the year instead of just signing it now. Also, for the return package for the Twins, um, let's get to J.J. Cooper from Baseball America with a little more on what they're getting back. No? Never mind. We'll get We'll get back to that. Uh, promise that's coming later on. So does this mean, like, is Kepler, or will, could they trade Kepler next? The twins? You want to ask Ken about all this? We can. Okay, is he ready? Ken ready to go? All right, let's do it. Ken Rosenthal, FT Senior Insider with us right now. We'll do this, then we'll get to Justin Turner. Okay, Ken, let's get your thoughts on the Mariners twins moves. I don't know how much you caught. And then AJ's already asking, you know, if there's another move coming for the twins. Is there's been quite a few players of theirs on the trade block, including Kepler and Polanco's name came up really throughout the offseason, right? Really interesting trade, first of all. And yes, they could trade Kepler. They have other options. They could maybe sign a free agent outfielder and then have the flexibility to do that. They saved some money in this deal, and that's going to help them, or they gained some flexibility. And their president of baseball operations, Derek Falvey, was very open last night in talking to reporters about the fact that this could lead to other things for them. Now, what's interesting about this trade to me from the Twins' perspective, and we'll get to Seattle too, but, J- AJ, you just asked if Correa regrets going there, if this move signals some kind of teardown. They have lost a good amount. They lost Sonny Gray. They lost Kenta Maeda. But at the same time, with regard to Polanco, they've got depth there. 
They've got Julian, who Scott talked about. They've got a prospect named Brooks Lee. They've got Royce Lewis in the infield, Carlos Correa. They are in a great position to make this kind of deal, and that's what they did. And they also got what I would say is an adequate return. Some people even thought that the Mariners gave up too much here, that they overpaid for Polanco. You get Topa, back of the bullpen guy, as you guys mentioned, and you get Di Sclafani, who should fit into their rotation. It's a health question with him. Of course, he hasn't pitched much the last couple of years. And you get two kids for the future. We'll see how they pan out. From the Mariners' perspective, it's interesting, too, because they – see themselves as a team that is still quite competitive. They've had financial restrictions. They can't operate the way maybe they would want to in a perfect world and certainly the way fans would want them to. But they've got Julio in center. They've got J.P. Crawford at short. They've got Polanco at second now. Kyle Raleigh behind the plate. That's pretty good up the middle. They've got pitching back into the bullpen, starting rotation. That's good too. You go out and compete and see what you can do there. So this wasn't just a money dump then by the Twins because it seems like every move they've made this offseason has been like, we got to shed money. And the Pollard family is one of the richest owners in well, baseball. AJ, I mean, we, we, and we all know they don't have a history of spending. Trust me. I was there when I've told the story. We had to buy our own, our own pullovers. So, I mean, it just seems like every move they make, they're like, okay, well, this is a money move. And they got money back from the Mariners. So maybe – Right. I guess that's to cover because I think Di Scalfani makes 12 and Polanco is making 10 and a half, maybe to cover the difference or, well, or something. Well, it, it's a it's kind just... of a complicated equation. And yes, they did get money in the deal, but I would never call it a dump when they get four guys back who will, in theory, contribute now and in the future. And as Derek Falvey said last night, they want to do more with the money that they gain, the flexibility that they gain. So it's four for one now. Could end up being five for one if they sign a free agent, which they could do to address another need. So, listen, both these teams, they're in the RSN web where they don't know what the heck is going on with the future. And, yes, they're owned by really rich people. And I don't know that it should make that much of a difference, right? We can all say that and we can all think it. And who knows? Maybe it's even true. But at the same time. These guys are not spending money, so these teams have to kind of adjust to that. The front offices do, and that's what, in my view, both these front offices are doing to the best of their ability. Now, we don't know how the trade is going to work out, but you can certainly see the logic from both sides. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the Mariners have a better roster now than they did last year? I was explaining to AJ, maybe this wasn't the best example, but they're trying to switch things up because I feel like they watched too many strikeouts, and that's the thing that they decided with their offense they were going to switch. I'm not saying... Jorge Polanco is the best contact hitter in the game or Mitch Garber, any of those guys, but they are an upgrade in terms of just swing and miss from what they had in those spots last year, right? They did want to create a little bit of a different identity. Yes. And they lost a good amount of offense. It's Teo Hernandez. It's Eugenio Suarez, Jared Kalanick. I looked this up last night. I believe that was about 25% of their home run total or close to it. That's a lot. But as you said, Scott, they got Garver, they got Polanco. They're going to be a little bit different. I don't know that they're going to be as powerful, but they see this as the way that they want to go now. And clearly that was an intent here, that they wanted to make it a little bit more of a contact-oriented offense. I don't even know that there are many players today you would even categorize as contact-oriented, but the guys they had, Suarez in particular, struck out a ton. Okay, so the, the, the Diamond Sports, Bally Sports thing keeps keeps popping up, right? The yes, Twins already no, said no. we got to cut payroll from about 155 to, to 125 to 130-ish, whatever the, whatever their number ends up being, okay? How long are we going to have to hear about the Diamond Valley thing being held over people's heads? Like, is this just a way for owners to hold down salaries until – and then all of a sudden, as soon as the free spring training or, or opening day happens, they're going to be like, hey, guys, we got all our money. Okay, we can sign people again. But, oh, wait, it's too late. Well, AJ, you make a great point, and we don't know exactly where it's going with the Diamond Valley thing and if it'll work out even better for clubs in the future when they get direct-to-consumer ability and all of that. Probably not. The cable model was really beneficial to clubs, as Evan Drellick explained on the show yesterday. But at the same time, if you're looking at this and taking a step back, every year it's a different excuse. Go back to... The pandemic. Oh, the pandemic. We're never going to make it. Biblical losses 
is what Tom Rickett said. Biblical force, losses. Force majeure. <laughs> and, and the team seems, and the sports seems to be doing just fine now, right? That was 2020. Then we had the lockout. Oh, we had the lockout. We can't spend money. Now this year it's regional sports networks. Every year it's something else. And listen, this is the way industry operates. They're always going to look to save money and cut costs, but fans should take it only so seriously. And I'm not saying that the RSN situation isn't real or isn't something that is having an impact or should have an impact. I get it. It has an impact. But again, I'm looking forward to next year's excuse because it will be something else. (laughs) Ken, what can you tell us about the newest Blue Jays third baseman? I like it. And I don't know that he's going to be the third baseman necessarily, but I like Justin going to that team. And you guys remember at the end of last season, I think we talked about this on the show. I certainly wrote about it. I kind of kept calling the Blue Jays paper tigers because they weren't the team on the field that they were on paper. They didn't play to their potential. We all would agree with that, I think. Mm -hmm. Justin Turner walks into that clubhouse, and I don't want to be critical of their team and who they have because they certainly have some decent veterans, George Springer foremost among them. But you've got an adult walking into the room. And to me, they need a little bit of that juice that they're going to get from him. And it's not that he's a yeller, it's not that he's vocal, but there's a way he goes about his business. And there is a seriousness he brings to his craft. That's how he saved and turned around his career. So in my view, this is a really good signing for them. And I wrote about this earlier this week. They tried to get Jock, couldn't get Jock. They wanted left-handed. They're still way right-handed. But the way it was explained to me by one of their front office people was, listen, if we can find a right-handed hitter who hits right-handed pitching, that's good too. Justin Turner hits right-handed pitching. Not like J.D. Martinez necessarily, but he's not going to cost what J.D. Martinez is going to cost. So it's a good deal in my view for the Blue Jays. It's the right guy. At some point, Justin Turner, 39 years old, is going to stop performing. Let's just hope for the Blue Jays' sake it's not this year. Well, Ken, are they better? Are they a better team right now than last year's team in your mind? I don't know. You lose Chapman. That's a good amount. They did sign Yariel Rodriguez. And if Manoa comes back, their starting pitching is going to be really a force. I don't know that I would say that they're better. They lost Belt, too. And Belt had a really good run for them. So they're different. They've got kind of Falefa coming in. He should help them. I still would like to see a left-handed power hitter join that team, another one, and go from there. They're one bat short, in my opinion, still. Does does the Justin Turner – we've heard – Joey Votto to the Blue Jays. Does this close the door on Joey Votto to the Blue Jays? You just said a left-handed power bat. That's not really Joey Votto at this stage in his career. And also, while we're on it, can this get Vladimir Guerrero Jr.? I know he was just named the MLB The Show 24 cover athlete, but he didn't have a very good year last year. I don't think Votto's going there. And I would expect this closes the door. Justin Turner at this stage of his career is mostly a DH. Let's face it. So... That's where I think this is going with Toronto. That's probably the role he will fill for them. And Joey Votto is not going to play over Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And he's kind of an excess of or a surplus that you don't need if you have Justin Turner. As for Vladimir Guerrero Jr., I am quite certain he wants to have a better year. And I don't know if Justin Turner can help him at all along those lines, but I would expect he's just going to play better. That was a weird year, no question about it. I Still have not gotten an explanation for why he didn't perform the way he did in 21 or, yeah, 21. But he, I am sure, wants to get back on track. Why would the Blue Jays not just sign Belt back then? I know it his could. back was an issue for a little while, but, yeah, why did why, the, is that door it closed? Could. Is that... To me, an outfielder would be even better uh, if they can get one, somebody who could – do some things out there. Michael Taylor might be one guy that they would look at. I know they've got Kiermaier to play center, so you don't necessarily need Michael Taylor. But one more guy. That's what I'm saying. One more guy, preferably left-handed. Doesn't have to be left-handed. But Belt, to me, would seem to be extraneous in the way that Votto is because Justin Turner is a primary DH. Yeah. You know who to look good in a Blue Jays uniform? Shohei Otani. He's a big left-handed strapping lad that can hit homers, Ken. I'm just saying. 
but it didn't work out. You know, he went to LA. You they know, tried. They, he went to a different blue team. They tried. Uh, they, I, listen, I know. I know. I, <laughs> speaking of teams trying, the Red Sox. Well, are they trying? Because they, no. they let Justin Turner. They're not. Okay. I mean, let's face it. They're the Boston Red Sox. Okay. They don't have this regional sports network problem. They own Nesson. They are a team that should be. As their chairman, Tom Werner, said earlier this offseason, they should be full throttle. They've got Jordan Montgomery sitting in Boston, working out in Boston. His wife is doing a residency in Boston. He is right in front of them. And maybe they'll sign him, but it sure doesn't seem like they're going to do anything big. Sam Kennedy, their team president, said at their winter event that they probably, or he indicated they might be cutting payroll. It's inexplicable to me the way they're running this thing. Now, they have young talent coming. They've got some interesting pieces, even this year, that they're going to incorporate. But, again, it's the Boston Red Sox. And why are they not spending more? Why are they, when they need a starting pitcher, when that's their number one thing, a top-of-the-rotation guy, with lost sale, who could have been that guy but maybe wasn't going to be, who's that guy? And if they sign Blake Snell, if they sign Jordan Montgomery, you can say, okay, I get it. Doesn't look like they're going to do that. And again, Montgomery is in their backyard. Granted, he's probably waiting for Texas, but maybe the Texas thing doesn't happen. And maybe that's what Boston's waiting for. Maybe they're thinking, okay, if that blows up, we can get Montgomery at a better price. But they could use, not could use, they need a top of the rotation guy. Ken, we were just talking about the Twins a little bit and the Blue Jays. And like you said, the Paper Tiger teams where they're better on paper. I think both those teams are kind of, counting on some of their key players being better this year than they were last year and taking steps forward. But you look, if the Blue Jays were in on Shohei, that means they have money to spend. What's to stop them from going out and getting a Cody Bellinger who's going to cost significantly less than a Shohei? What's, and what's – same kind of question for Boston. If they're still the Boston Red Sox, why aren't these teams spending? And why does it always take so late in the winter up until right in spring training for people to even make moves on this? Jason, that's a good question, and I wouldn't put it entirely on the teams that it's taking this long. Scott Boris, the agent for many of these top free agents, Romney Chapman, Bellinger, he certainly is not afraid to protract these things as long as he wants to. So that's part of it, too, in fairness. Now, the difference between a Shohei Otani and a Bellinger is Shohei Otani not only is going to generate value for you on the field, he's going to generate immense value for you off the field. And I would think that the Jays viewed him as an exception. So if you sign him, you get all this added extra revenue. If you sign Cody Bellinger, who is not as sure a thing because he had last year as a resurgence, but the couple of years before that, admittedly, when he was physically compromised, not so good. It's not the same. It's not going to have the same financial impact on your club, on your organization. That is the hesitation. I would imagine that they don't see Bellinger like they saw Shohei Otani. But at the same time, you raise a good point. Why not? I know you've got Kiermaier in center and you've got Vlad Jr. at first, so Cody Bellinger doesn't fit so naturally. But I don't know. Good players seem to be a good thing for a team. Cody Bellinger's a good player. All right. So I really want to get to the topic of not trying. <laughs> The <laughs> Oakland A's There's article. No, 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 no. But this is another level, okay? And you know how passionate I am on this topic. Ken put out an article about the Oakland A's. So, Ken, I'll let you kind of just open up the parts that stood out. But there is one part I'd definitely like you to touch on is the sources that are saying behind the scenes what kind of payroll they're anticipating in the future to ramp up. Because to me, that was some news that they're floating around there. They haven't really talked about what that would look like. You put some numbers out there and I was cracking up because I'm like, if anybody believes that they are going to play ball anywhere close to $200 million before 2089, they're nuts. (laughs) 2089? (laughs) Well, (laughs) what I reported is that what they are projecting is in the years leading up to the opening of the Vegas ballpark, probably 2026, 27 with the ballpark opening in 28, they're projecting to be in 130 to $150 million range. And then once the ballpark opens, they are projecting $170 million plus payrolls. Now, I asked the team president, Dave Cavill, about those numbers. He would not confirm them, but 
he did say, we expect to be in the higher end. Now, the average payroll last year was 165. So if you're going to be in the higher end with salaries going up by 2028, it's going to be in that range minimally, 165, 170 plus. Will they get there? My whole premise of the column was I'm skeptical of this whole thing, that I'll believe it when I see it because we have heard a lot of things from the A's over the years and look at them. <laughs> look at where they are. Look at what John Fisher has spent. His highest payroll ever was $92 million in 2019. Now, he will say, Dave Cavill said, that because of the additional resources they'll get in Vegas, they'll now be able to spend. They'll be able to sign their own players, which they haven't done in the past. They'll be able to enter the free agent market. Now, for anybody who's followed the A's, under Fisher in particular, this is like shocking to hear, and it was shocking for me to hear. That's their plan. I'll believe it when I see it, like I said. And again, even if they execute it, you're asking John Fisher to spend money in the ramp-up years when, by the way, they don't have a home park. 2025 to 27. They're going to find one, but it's not going to be most likely a major league park. Well, he's going to spend money that he doesn't have. John Fisher, the way he's run his team over the years, let's just call me skeptical. All right. So I actually read this article of yours <laughs> one of the few times that I actually uh, read thank the you, whole AJ. thing. Yeah, Deep well, welcome. You got my, you got my athletic it took money. Took him three hours. There was, there was only a couple <laughs> of pictures in that I could, that I kind of was trying to get through. Okay. But, by the way, I'm still waiting for my reimbursement for the athletic, but one day you'll get it to me. That's a whole different yeah, one day. story. But you, you get a free subscription? No, I Ken said he didn't reimburse me, but he's yet to. So no, you have know. to read every article ever from Ken. Whatever. Oh, get, okay. That's what it's gonna take get. me forever. Um, <laughs> but I I love what you said though. You're like, they could stay in Oakland, maybe they could stay in Oakland, but is Oakland one of them after this year coming up? Because if they stay in Oakland, they get to keep their TV money. But if they move to Sacramento, it's outside the Bay Area, so they don't get the money. If they move to Vegas, they're going to have to renegotiate a TV deal. There's no way John Fisher is going to want to pass up that money. So where are they well, going to play? Because, again, I mean, I, I I get what you're saying, and I've been saying this from the get-go. They're talking about Vegas, Sacramento, Oakland, here, there, Salt Lake, blah, blah. If I'm the Players Association, I'm telling John Fisher to fuck off. And I'm like, pick a place we got to play, because I don't want my players playing – all over. Yeah, I mean, it worked in Toronto because of COVID. I get how they did it. They did it for a short time. But for three years, you're going to bounce players around? That's not fair. And there's no way all of a sudden, miraculously, in 26 or 27, if they get their new stadium in 28, John Fisher's going to be like, okay, let's raise our payroll, I don't know, $125 million in one offseason? It's never going to happen. So I, I agree with you on this, Ken. I, I think this is all just a farce from them. AJ, first of all, I'm glad you read the article. And second, I'm glad you brought this up because this is a key point. So as the San Francisco Chronicle has reported, the local TV deal that they have with NBC Sports California paid them $67 million last year. And as you mentioned, once you leave the Bay Area, that money is not there. Now, you could negotiate, renegotiate with Sacramento or even Salt Lake City to get some other kind of deal with Vegas. You create kind of a new TV market with Sacramento and Vegas, or with Salt Lake City and Vegas, but it's not going to match what it is in the Bay Area. So do you stay in Oakland and keep collecting the $67 million? That would be hard to imagine. Do you play some games in Oracle Park to get a portion of that money? That's the Giants' home park. Maybe you can figure that out. There are ways to do this, but it doesn't seem like, in the end, it's going to be as lucrative. And again, as you said, AJ, and as I wrote, John Fisher is going to walk away from $67 million. If that's what it is in the subsequent years, it might even be higher. It's hard to imagine that. And again, when you look at this whole picture, what I'm talking about here, how it will work in the years 2025 to 27 when they're vagabonds, how it will work once they get to Vegas, how this all will play out, it's difficult for anyone who has paid attention to look at this and say, yeah, I get that. That makes a ton of sense to me that I'm sure they will do that. I want to see it before I believe it. There's no way, Ken. The Giants, have you, I mean, you've, you've been in the Bay Area enough to know. I mean, I played for the Giants. There was billboards about Giants versus A's. There is no way in hell you had a better chance of me reading another one of your articles than the Giants do of letting the A's play in San Francisco. Well, they let them play there for a price, I'm sure. I don't, you I don't think? think it's out of the question. You think? It, it, 
it's something that is under discussion. And I don't know where they're wow. going with it. Cavill wouldn't comment on what their plans are for the interim play period. I know Salt Lake City is really serious about hosting them. It would be in a minor league park. They could play in their own AAA park in Summerlin, Nevada. That's part of Vegas. Again, I'll believe it when I see it. And in this article as well, I asked Tony Clark about this. And Tony Clark at the All-Star break addressed the baseball writers. We have an annual press conference with him then. And he expressed concerns about the amenities of where they're going to play, the way players will be housed, all of the different things that come into play, playing conditions in a AAA park. And I asked him again a couple of days ago, and he said, same concerns. I have the same concerns. So, yes, they're going to have to get through the Players Association, and I'm not so sure it's going to be easy. Yeah, there's so many steps. So John, okay, so made. if they made $67 million off TV, what was their payroll? $40 million last year? Uh, $50 million? That. Yep. So they made yep. it. There's, there's 20, that's just local TV. But that's there's, $20 million that's they made before TV. revenue sharing, before all the other gate, stuff. Gate, t- National parking, TV. That's what I'm saying. Bam, all the BAM money, that all that stuff they all get. Dude, John Fisher made $100 million last year. Probably. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but he's close. It's very basic math. Can they, yeah, use 50, 000, can they use 50,000 on those dugouts, bathrooms? <laughs> <laughs> no. Just, just no. 20, Evidently not, Jason. Anything. Anything. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Ken, obviously, we're, we're dumbing it down a little bit, but that, that is the basic math. I mean, you, you look at a team. I know there's more than just the player salaries, but when you add up the rest, it's not crazy usually, and you do the math. I mean, it's hard to look at a situation like that and not be like, wait, where is all of the money going? That's a very good point. And these teams will tell you, not just the A's, but other low revenue teams that don't spend enough on major league payroll, we're spending on infrastructure. We talked about this with the Marlins recently. We're spending on player development. We're spending on scouting. I think they're I'll tell you who helps out the A's. Scott, when he shops a baby gap for his shirt. No, I'm on a – I'm on a uh... – you're on a gap hiatus? Gap, Man, gap, now, gap your, hiatus. your wardrobe has been gap slacking. For anyone that's out of the loop, that's the Fisher family, John's owns family. The, owns Not John. He hasn't done anything for himself no. ever. Ken, thank you very much. Appreciate the time and great article. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, Ken. It is a great article, so check mm-hmm. it out in The Athletic. And also, Ken's Fair Territory explains more of the A's Vegas situation, uh, the Hector Neri signing, a little Hall of Fame recap. And a lot more if you check it out. He does a, a great monologue at the top, too, on the BBWAA awards. Okay, let's keep this going for a sec because, Kip, we haven't had you on for some of this. So where are we at with the player perspective on this? Do the players know what's going on? Are they concerned if you're a player on the A's? And I know most of their players are league minimum. I just got to the league. I don't care. I'm just happy to be in the bigs. But like we've been talking about, there is a union. Like the league is split into two. It's the league and the league office and then the union and the players. I mean, there has to be a line here, I would think, where they have to agree that this can't fly. Hey, we're going to play here. We're going to play there, right? It's, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of it. I think it's, as, and even as a player who's trying to sign there or who's playing there, it's, it's, a, it's a land of opportunity for only specific players. But, uh, if you're a rookie trying to get established, you're happy just to be there and you overlook a lot of the problems and if you're playing in different stadiums. If you're an old guy trying to sign on to a team and stay in the league, you're happy to play for Oakland. But if you're these other players that are going, that are trying to win, um, the fact that they're talking about playing over at different stadiums or not knowing where home is, not knowing all these variables, uh, on top of just Oakland wanting to or trying to spend money here in the future, who's going to want to sign there? with all these unknowns and they don't care because they don't want to sign anyone they, anyway. They, they, but, they don't care. Know. Yeah. But it's, they, I mean, you're signed not Alex Wood the other day. Great. You're not signing there to win ball games. Clearly no. if they're not going to be spending money and there looks like they're not, um, they're, they're already, they're handcuffing themselves in the free agent market, even before they open the pocketbook. I think it's imperative that, Whenever there is a ball club in Vegas, that team puts its best efforts forward right from the jump. Well, they have to get the fans excited right away. Yeah. Like they have that's, to come in and the Knights did that. The, yeah, but they have to come. Yeah, you know, the Knights are expansion and they made the Stanley and, Cup. No, they made the finals the first year. Of that's ever. what I'm saying. 
and then they just won this past year. Like they have brought winning right off the but jump. They need Does to come anyone in and believe bring this fire. regime whoever, is going to win. Whoever in 2028 is a free agent that year, you have to expect, or you have to expect Las Vegas to throw big money at you. Yeah. If you're like a top of the, I mean, I don't even, I mean, it's so far away from, but sure. I mean, I'm sure we can project out who could possibly be a free agent. But think about it. If you're a free agent that year, the A's have got to hit it because they got to get the fans excited. If they go in there with a $45 million payroll of all rookies, people in Las Vegas mm-hmm. are going to be like, we don't care. Don't care. There's too many other things that's to all, do. That's, to that's always the formula. You want to, you, he's right. You want to sign those big players right when you have that new stadium or that new market to – it also kind of helps offset the cost of it where you bring in, get the excitement going. So maybe all this money that he's saving up these and they're making these years – uh, till they're open, maybe he'll finally open that that checkbook come twenty twenty eight. Now, if you're a free agent, it's not a bad place to go if the organization gets cleaned up or hopefully just gets sold. Is the real goal for everyone, right? I think you want some stability as a player. You want to know where you'll be, where your your family will be, where your your interests are vested in. It's just not the same when you're moving around and don't have an owner who's like on the same side or on the same page as you. It's kind of like the opposite. But the thing is, though, they can't they can't wait until twenty eight to spend all their money. If that's when the stadium gets done, if the stadium ever gets done, because we're already seeing hiccups in the renderings and everything else that they're talking about. Like we haven't seen a final rendering because of what they say because of the flu or what was it? The flu was going around. There's the been reason? there's 9, been a million different reasons. There was a terrible tragedy, but it was months ago. They True. blamed that. Then they said they were waiting on something from I think Valleys and Valleys was like, no, we're waiting for them. It, it's one thing after another. The dude. The owner can't even hire an architect to, to make a drawing, <laughs> right? That, but, like the league's been like, can you just give us give us something, a real drawing that actually portrays what this is going to look like? Because they did a fake one, remember, when yeah. they were first trying to talk everyone into it. Agreed. It's a movie. This is a, this is a great fucking movie. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be Moneyball too. I just got to figure out how I can make a comeback and end it. Uh, again, <laughs> like the first one. Um, but I, I don't, I just, it's unbelievable. It's just, um, this has just been so poorly done, handled from the get go, from they're leaving to they're not leaving to where, and oh my gosh. The best thing for baseball we've had this cover, John Fisher, just sell the team, just to give someone else an opportunity to figure something out because Vegas doesn't want you. They, they really don't. I mean, they say what they do, but they really don't. And Oakland, I don't think Oakland wants you now. So now you're kind of on the hook for where do we go? I mean, they're going to end up in Vegas somehow, some way, whether he forces them to. But gosh, like if, if I'm the owner of the A's, which I obviously have not, I am building the biggest, baddest ass stadium I could ever imagine. I'm not nickel and diming it. And if it's a smaller capacity, fine. If it's only like like Cleveland's only, what, 35,000 people. If it's a smaller capacity stadium, but I, it's got to have all the bells and whistles. It's got to have everything you can – like kind of like the Raiders stadium they say – I've never been, but they say it's, sure. once you walk in, it's unbelievable, right? It's got to be like SoFi in L.A. where people walk in and they're like, oh, or, or when AT&T opened in Dallas for the Cowboys, everyone's like, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. It's got to be like that because they're counting on local people coming and tourists coming. And in order to get people to come into a stadium, it's got to have something cool that no one's ever seen before. So you got to spend money. You can't nickel and dime. You can't cheap it out. you got to make it something cool where people, it's a destination. And I just don't see them doing that with this ownership group. People want the player perspective on this show, obviously, with you guys giving your authentic take. Is this not going to be talked about nonstop whenever, let's say, Kip, you were on Cleveland, right? And you're playing in Oakland this season or the A's are coming to you. Isn't that what you're talking about? Maybe you got a former teammate who's now on Oakland or you're just, you know, kind of chopping it up with the guys. Is this not what you talk about for a few minutes, like the small talk Uh, where you get going? You'll run out to center field with like five prepared questions. (laughs) <laughs> and just like, tell me everything. What is going on over there? What's what are the worst things that's happened? Absolutely, you run out with questions to ask and hope you get them answered before. Because they... it's just, it's just, it's going to be going on for a while. Yeah, and that's the ownership's fault. They they put themselves in this in this whole problem. The thing I don't understand here, we're showing some tweets here. Here's Shana Rubin, who covers the team for the Athletic. We know very little about John Fisher as a person, except that he was a Giants fan before he <laughs> bought the A's. Suddenly, a lot of the carelessness with which he's managed the org. Roots, uh, organization's roots to Oakland makes sense. And we saw the tweet earlier from Danny Vietti saying that their payroll was in the low 40s and that John Fisher said he did everything he could. So I just, I can't emphasize enough how confusing this whole situation is for uh, the son of, of a billionaire family 
to want to just shatter name legacy the whole deal for a few extra bucks just go into a different industry that's the part i don't understand if he sold it he'd make a billion dollars right now more than that i mean they're going to vegas the team's probably going to be worth close to two billion dollars because they already have that relocation at this point it's even just people in vegas like please we don't want to deal with this villain he will mess up every single thing from front to back i just don't understand like think about it for, for any of you any normal person out there that's not a billionaire would, would, would this be what you choose to do with your life? Apparently. Maybe he's a diehard Giants fan. Maybe he's really going about he's it. Just he's just really, completely, he's completely yeah. trying to wreck This it. takes tanking to another level. It's from yeah. the end. He's, he's, he's bombing them from the end. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, I mean, we can go all day on it. It was a great article from Ken. Yes, a lot of people saying I need, I need some type of allergy medicine or something like that. Why don't you host for the next hour? You've always wanted to do Does it. You mean you're leaving? I could leave if. Do you think you could handle it? I mean, I'm sure Kip and I would be just fine, wouldn't we, Kip? We'd we'd be fine. We'd survive. I mean, we would miss Scotty's just wise cracks and just his brilliant <laughs> additions. But I tell you what, we wouldn't miss is his non puffed up hair. You love that. That was a big hit. Not your best on, day. On He's still no, handsome. Been, hey, Kip, two days in a row of just not good hair for him. It's not bad. Don't listen to him, Scotty. In one ear, out the other. You're a handsome yeah. devil. Thank you. Don't listen to him. Don't let him in there. Right back at you. He's he's not there. He can't even get in there. It's so stuffed up right now. Yeah, seriously. There's so much mucus in that thing. <laughs> he couldn't get in if he tried right now. But by the way, in case I do disappear, uh, the schedule for the rest of the day, we're going to talk to Nolan Gorman in one sec. Um, Nathaniel Lowe is going to join us later, and we'll still get our take on the Justin Turner signing with the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. But let's get to the power-hitting second baseman on the St. Louis Cardinals right now making his FT debut. Nolan Gorman joining us right now. Nolan, happy offseason, man. How you doing? Good, guys. How are you guys? Good, good. Did you just get a workout in? Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I just finished some time. Nice. All are, right. you, are you in Jupiter or are you in Arizona? I'm in Arizona right now. Well, when are you headed down to God's country? <laughs> I'll leave. Uh, I'll leave here in about two weeks. Two weeks from uh, yesterday, so February twelfth, I'll go down there and get there a week early and get the layout again. There you go. But have you seen the new? Because they they ripped up Roger Dean, right? So you guys are like in trailers this year, aren't you? Or some crazy? It's going to be crazy for you guys because you don't have your clubhouse. Is that right? It's They're not renovated. Finished? No, they like redid no. the whole thing. They like, destroyed the stadium. No, they. Uh, they were going to, and then they knocked a few walls down, and uh, it went back to pretty much normal. I think they had to put some walls back up, but um, yeah, they they stopped the renovation, so should be normal this year. Oh, there you go. What do you mean you stop? It's like the A's. I didn't know the A's. <laughs> I didn't know the A's were in Jupiter. Now they were going, and then they're like, "Wait, no, we're stopping that." Well, we're gonna go. I mean, maybe they're gonna push it back. I don't, I don't know. Because they were supposed to redo the whole thing, and the, and the Cardinals and the and the. Marlins were supposed to be like in trailers for one spring. I thought it was this spring. Where did you hear this? That's no, that's true. No. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, he's 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 right. It was supposed to happen. We were supposed to be in like tents for uh, the clubhouse and stuff, but they, uh, like I said, they just stopped it. All right, so then normal spring training for you. Who are you most excited to spend some time with that is – a new St. Louis Cardinal, because you guys have added, I mean, obviously the three big pitchers towards the beginning of the season and a, a few guys since then. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, all those signs I think are, are uh, good for us in, in terms of um, some, some veterans that uh, have been there and obviously gone to the World Series and whatnot. But I'm excited to get back with Carp. Um, I had good conversations with him when I was uh, coming up in the minor leagues when he was still with us. And uh, so, yeah, I'm excited to, to have him back and just, you know, be able to pick his brain some more. Nolan, what kind of expectations are you going into this year? Now that you've kind of had a season a little bit under your belt now, you kind of know the lay of the land around there a little bit. You know what to expect from the big leagues here and there. What kind of expectations are you going into this year? Yeah, I mean, Nothing. There's nothing crazy. I just, you know, the biggest thing for me is going out there and being consistent, um, you know, consistency and playing, you know, 162 games uh, for me is the most important thing. Uh, staying healthy, keep my body right. Um, and I feel if, if I'm consistent, I can stay out on that field, then uh, then good things will happen. So when we talked to Carp, 
did you just talk about offense? Because he wasn't a very good defender and he's slow as hell. So you weren't talking <laughs> base running and you weren't talking defense. So what was he talking to you about hitting wise? No, honestly, um, there was a little bit of, of offensive stuff, but it was more just kind of how to play how to play the game. I guess how you know they've done it for for the last few years. I think in twenty one, he came up to me early one morning in spring and and just talked about um, you know what a what a possible role would be you know for a guy coming up, um, maybe not playing every day. And uh, just getting that that experience, but not being an every everyday guy yet, because uh, I think he was kind of in that same boat um, right before he left us. So, yeah, I it was more so like you know just make sure you're you're ready at all times. Um, you know the time it is coming soon, and uh, it's pretty much just just trying to be ready for any possible situation that comes. Did, did Carp come up to you and say? Listen, I'm going to be here for my entire career, Nolan, so just do as I say. Don't do what I do here because you're never going to get my job. So you're going to have to be a utility guy because I'm Matt Carpenter and I went to TCU and I'm Mr. Cardinal. No, he's uh, he's a little better dude than that. But, uh, <laughs> all right, was, so I played uh, with Carp, so I, I know Carp. <laughs> yeah. He is one of my all-time favorite guys to give shit to because he just can't take for it sure. very well. So like if you if, when you see him just be like man carp your beard is like super gray and he'll be like whoa, whoa, whoa. And he'll be you'll see him five minutes later he'll be have the just for men out making sure that it's not gray. Yeah no, uh, yeah like I said I didn't get a lot of time with him but uh, the little time that I did he was a pretty good mentor for me. Now Nolan when you uh, kind of moved across the diamond a little bit from third to second base and I know uh, did you have a little. Kind of a little back issue in 2020, a little weightlifting thing. Did you yeah. did you find yourself yeah. when you made the position change that you kind of had to switch? There's a little bit more movement at second base than there is for third. You kind of have to do a little bit more sprint work, a little bit more calisthenics, kind of stretch out that body and be a little quicker. Talk us through for that. For sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so honestly, at third base, you know, it's it's a slow position. You're not you know, you're not chasing balls down that much. You're kind of more of a hockey goalie. So uh, over there, it was, it was a little easier to be slower and and uh, not get good jumps off the ball and still be able to get to it. But at second base last year, this was before spring training, um, our new bench coach, Joe McEwing, for last year was uh, talking to me, hitting me ground balls, and uh, he had me go out to shortstop. And um, he was like, all right, just go take regular ground balls at shortstop, throw the ball over to first and uh, I moved way better than I was at second base. And he just said, now go play second base the way you just did that at shortstop as far as like getting off the ball quicker, um, kind of just staying flat footed, letting the ball come to me. It was still attacking the ball. I think that was the biggest thing that helped me um, between 22 and 23 was just getting off the ball and uh, a little bit quicker and, and making those adjustments that I was able to later, you know, reading hops and whatnot. Have, have you spoken, because Joe's not there anymore, have you spoken to your new bench coach yet, Daniel Descalso? Has he brought any words of wisdom? Yeah, he uh, he came in actually to, to the place that I'm working out at uh, a couple weeks ago, but we just, we talked a little bit, um, got to know each other a little bit, but that was about it. Do you know him from the past or was that your first time meeting him? No, first interactions with him, um, but seemed like an awesome dude. I've, I've talked to some other people that have obviously played with him or, or coached him, and uh, they've had nothing but great things to say about him. I'll swing it over to another. Was he your former teammate or no? I guess he was. Yeah, so another oh, former teammate specialist. Dude, I got the Cardinal handbook, dude. What's what the scouting report? I mean, <laughs> the, the I mean, he was on the show. Report. You saw his I scouting I understand, report. but Nolan might not have caught the uh, He's great. He's a little short. He gets really mad if you make short jokes in front of him. <laughs> um, but uh, he's actually a really great dude. No, he, he'll, he'll work hard. He loves the Cardinals. Uh, I, I know. Listen, he, he's he's going to help you guys. I played for Joe, and I when Joe was a coach, too, he was great. But – Descalso is fired up. He can't wait to get there. And he just wants to get back to the Cardinal way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it <laughs> makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> do, you, do you have the handbook? Do you have the Cardinal way handbook? Did they ever give that to you? No, I've, I've heard you ask this question before, but um, I don't believe I still have that. 
I remember uh, watching. But you did get. But you did get one. I I believe they they passed out something. They definitely, yeah, laminated, they definitely laminated, laminated pamphlet. <laughs> no, but when you're first yeah, round pick, they're like they give you things. a leaflet, and you're like. <laughs> Just go play, kid. You're going to be good. Okay, we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Nolan, I don't know if you remember, but I think, you know, I, the first time I, I spoke to you and interviewed you was Arizona Fall League, which was, was it 2021? Were you there? Yep. Was that the year? Yep. Okay. So then in 2022, you start out the season in the minor leagues. You hit 15 home runs in 34 games. You basically hit a home run every other freaking game. And they were like, Uncle, okay, we got it. And they called you up in mid-May. When you were going through that tear, were you like looking around going, when is it? <laughs> when is the time? <laughs> I mean, that is a statement if there ever is one. And if I'm a team front office wise and knowing that you're at the upper levels of the minors, I'm like, damn, we got to get some of these homers into the bigs. Yeah, there was obviously uh, a little bit of, you know, when, when's it going to be my turn? But at the same time, it was I was still playing baseball down there and, and having to focus on that and not – you know, turn into a, a mess and maybe get myself into a slump thinking about all that stuff. But um, yeah, I think at a, at a certain point, I think when I when I kept hitting him, it was like, all right, I think I'm ready. But then, you know, you get up there and it's like, it's a different game. It really is in, in, the, in the big leagues. It's, you learn a lot. And I think I've learned more in these past two years than I think I have my whole life uh, in the game of baseball. So it's uh, it's definitely a learning curve for sure. When you got up after that, were you like, "Oh crap! I hope I didn't just like <laughs> waste my streak on the minors." Obviously, you needed to do that to, you know, send the message to get up. But once you got to the big leagues, were you like, "Oh shit! I hope this stays, you know, in check." And like you mentioned, obviously, it's a different game. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I wanted it to continue, um, and it it really didn't. They. Uh, I think I was doing good, you know, a little bit in the beginning, and then they they pick at you and uh, they find out where your weaknesses are, and and they won't start ex stop exploiting them until you make an adjustment. So uh, there was a little stretch there where I got to learn, you know, going into the off season what I needed to work on, and um, I think that was that was pretty big for me going into into the last year. Nolan, have you had like a what was your? We all have like a wow, this is the big leagues moment. What was your wow? This is I'm in the big leagues moment for you. Uh, it was actually the day I debuted. Um, I think I just got my first hit. Uh, I went out into the to play second base and I just kind of looked around um, the whole stadium and I was like, I'm in the freaking big leagues. Like this is kind of crazy. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was that, same, that same day right after my first hit and I went, went back out on defense. Um, it was at PNC, which I think to this day is still one of the nicest looking stadiums and, and backgrounds in baseball. Um, but yeah, that, that was it. Just out in, out in the field, kind of looking around the stadium. You didn't feel that same electricity in our Memphis Gwinnett games? <laughs> you, you didn't get that same rush not, of adrenaline? Not exactly. Not on, uh, not on those Tuesdays. <laughs> not in... I had a I had adrenaline every time we played in Memphis, that's for sure. But um, the humidity yeah. alone will get your yeah. blood going. Yeah, yeah, for who sure. Was, who was who? Who were your first? At, who were your first at bats off? And who who was the first hit off? Uh, first at bat was uh, Zach Thompson um, with the with the Pirates. Uh, he was first at bat, first hit. Um, I remember that, and then uh, my my first home run came like eight days later. But to be honest with you, I I always blank on the name from the Brewer. Uh oh. Oh, we lost him. Or you got a phone call. Or both. All right, we'll get back to him in just a sec. Wow, lost wow. Nolan. Car was going smoothly. Yeah. AJ, who was your first your first hit? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Billy Taylor, closer for the A's. Billy Taylor. Taylor. Wow. Kev, was yours against the White Sox? Uh, 
No, it was versus the Angels. It was the first hit. My first couple of bats were versus the White Sox. It was a Gavin Floyd cutter that had broke my bat and dribbled right back to him. Oh, perfect. Well, that's the only time we got time you out. So. <laughs> that's the only time we got you <laughs> out. So. <laughs> He, th- he threw a cutter at my uh, my shin, my second at bat, and I was so excited that I finally got on base that I did one of those just hideous limp runs to first base and before I got taken out of the game. Oh, that's that's funny. That's funny. Why didn't you join the White Sox at some point? Uh, it was an either-or. I wanted to play for other teams once I was a free agent. It was the Cubs or the White Sox. I would have been happy to play for both. Uh, I grew up going to both games. Um did a high five sports camp that took field trips to the Cubs games. I think my family went to both, maybe even more White Sox games than that. Uh, they live on the north side, uh, the northern suburbs, so they could probably actually get to – my parents could get to a game. It takes them less time to go to Milwaukee Stadium than it does to go around the entire city to get to the White Sox. Wow. Yeah. That's why the White Sox are looking to move all the way north. So then yeah, they right. can be the north side, and that way Kipnis's parents are closer. Yeah, right. unfortunately, I, I won't be suiting up anytime soon anymore. No, it's a little late. <laughs> By yeah, the way, I'm out of, I'm out of breath run. tying my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Gorman's first home run was off Adrian Hauser. Mm-hmm. Now New York Met. Well, then, Kip, who was your first home run off of? Danny Duffy. Oh, lefty, huh? Nice. On left, but when I wore a younger man's shoes, I was able to hit lefties. Apparently, in, in KC or in Cleveland, in Cleveland, in Cleveland. Dude, Danny Duffy, when he was he was nasty in his prime, was nasty. He threw hard. Yeah. Oh, it was it was a, a full count three two. Worked my way back. That I put all my eggs into the basket. That it was going to be a fastball. Wow. And yeah. I it oh, hit on just yeah. like it hit like a foot over the the fence. It wasn't exactly a, a no doubter. It's okay. It don't works. matter. Yeah, don't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. You were you touched all the pillows again. Yeah, that's a good name to get. First. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not going to BS for longer because I don't know if Gorman's coming back. He is. He is back. Okay. I was about to go to another topic, but we'll yeah. bring him back in just. Now a we sec. can now now that we know who you hit your first homer off of, we can talk about it. It changes everything. We did the homework. <laughs> we needed that minute. You know, we got the name for you, Adrian Hauser. Yep. Yep. That's it. Now a Met. No, I'm yeah, not, sorry yeah. about that. My uh, no. my phone somehow overheated while I'm in the <laughs> while I'm in the truck. So, oh, there's a lot of jealous people I, I, that are cold around I, the country right now. Yeah, wait, wish their phones the overheated. Yeah, yeah, he's in Arizona. Um, I will right. say this: that's the first time we've ever had someone. Usually, it's a phone call or yeah. someone someone's kid hits the red button to stop. But that's the first time <laughs> we've ever had someone say my phone overheated. So, way to go! <laughs> that's a big yeah. step. I'm glad I could be a first. Nolan, I got a question for you. So, you know, you, you're locked in for second base time, right, this coming season. Um, that's been the spot for you. How was it for a lot of the young outfielders to kind of mix and match? Like, we had Tyler O'Neill on the other day, and, you know, we, we're happy for him because he gets to probably get full-time reps with the Red Sox. I don't think they're adding anything else to their lineup. So he's going to basically play every day if he's healthy and on the field. So just being around some teammates that would either get platooned or just were in an all-out battle at the major league level to try and get a spot, you know, what's that like to experience? Obviously, you know, secondhand to see that going on for some of the guys. Yeah, I think uh, that was kind of set at the beginning of spring training last year of knowing that there's a lot of competition between the players within the organization and. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not easy. I mean, I I did it, uh, too, against lefties, especially during the beginning of this past year and then 22. I wasn't facing lefties at all. And um, so, it, yeah, it's definitely it, – it's a tough role um, for anybody to be able to come off the bench. And I think having Albert in 22 was, uh, was a big piece for us because he was so good. I mean, just – in general, he was so good that he could come off the bench and, you know, take a left hand at bat and uh, especially in that second half, do some damage. But, um, yeah, it's definitely a it's a hard situation to be in. But I think, uh, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of of being ready no matter what what's thrown at you. It's it's out of your control, really. 
Um, so, yeah, it's not not a situation anyone wants to ever be in, though, because obviously you want to go out there and, and play every day and uh, help the team win. What's the conversation like with Ollie Marmol or whoever, Mosellock, whoever it is? Like, dude, I want to play against lefties. I could hit lefties coming up. All of a sudden, now I can't hit lefties. They're throwing it the same way. Right. So what's the conversation like? Is it just a matter of when you because I, I, I hit left handed, Kip hit left handed. And I know when I first came up, Tom Kelly's like, well, this guy can't hit lefties. I'm like, how do you know, dude? You never seen me hit a lefty. I can hit lefties. OK. I mean, it wasn't the same as righties, obviously. But, right. you know, and, and then when you get the opportunity, you're like, God, I have to get it. Oh, my gosh, I have to get if I don't get a hit here, I'm never going to face a lefty again. Right. So what, what's the conversation like either from you to the to Ollie or Ollie back to you to try to get those opportunities? I mean, there wasn't too much of conversation. It was just kind of like I knew that was happening just because it was happening on the regular. Um, you know, when I would face a when we'd face a lefty or a lefty would come in from the pen, kind of knowing like, all right, you're not gonna hit here. Um, but I I would have conversations with like our hitting coach Turner Ward and and just talk about you know what what the what the reason is or or why they our platooning guys, especially young guys who, you know, they, they want to be up there being everyday guys and helping the team win. Um, and it's just, you know, it comes down to analytics and, and what, you know, the numbers say and who's going to give them their best shot to, to win or win that at bat at least. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the, the answer that I got was it all comes down to analytics, but towards the end of the year, last year, I got to face lefties. And I mean, just like anything, you, you see it more, uh, more times and um, more consistently, you're going to get better at it no matter what. So, um, yeah, I was, I was lucky enough last year to to be able to start facing them at, towards the end of the year, maybe middle of the year, and um, had some success, I thought. No, let's well, finish don't say, oh, okay. oh, sorry, it's got to go. Do you want me to go? No, I was no, just going to say a, good, a fun uh, – now that we got three lefties, probably a rarity on this show to have three guys who can talk about it. And First off, you didn't get lucky to face them. You earned that – back later in the year but would you find i want aj to comment on this too when you go left when you're lefty did facing lefties lock you in for righties because you let the ball travel a little bit better you, you kept your hands inside the ball i would always find facing lefties even if it wasn't the most successful at bat or something it locked me in to face a righty do you find that way what do you use when you go versus lefty and versus righty uh yeah i mean i'd, I'd agree with that um I think if I if I train too much lefty, I can get a little pull happy just trying to get the bat out in front a little bit more because the ball gets on you for whatever reason a little more, um, you know, left on left. But uh, I find that that it definitely has helped lock me back into righties. If my approach is right, if I'm, you know, looking to drive the ball to left center field off of them, let it get a little deeper, maybe track the, the slider a little better. Um, but then also this year, I, I kind of changed up how I face lefties when it comes to my stance. I try to match their angle. Uh, so the ball's not really coming from behind me. It's more just like, like a regular, that. yeah, regular pitch. Um, and that, that seemed to be the biggest thing. And towards the end of the year last year, I kind of, I was hitting lefties really well. And so I was like, why don't I just try to open up against righties too? Just make sure I get back to, to center. And uh, my approach is, is still always through through center field. Um, and honestly, it, it, it worked out for the time that I was doing. I think I, it lasted for about two weeks. And then I ended up getting hurt in Baltimore. But um, that two-week stretch was, was pretty solid for me. So it's just something I've been uh, training this offseason of, of – being able to start a little open and it helps me not sway back in my swing. Um, and it's kind of just, you know, loading into that back hip a lot better than, than the alternative of swaying back and then swaying forward. Understood. As a guy who hit open, I get it. Listen, uh, the biggest thing for me hitting lefties, like Kip said, was you got to keep your angles the same. So you adjusting to the, the pitch, the way it's coming makes a lot of sense because the biggest thing lefties do is, because we run to first, we obviously open up because the ball is more on that side. So you got to really just fight to keep your angles. And I agree. Like sometimes it locks you in, sometimes it messes you up. I went a whole year hit only left-handed BP from a, uh, in Chicago, and I had a good year. And then the next year they're like, "You want to do it again?" And I was like, "No, not really." And uh, didn't have quite as good of a year. So maybe it was a thing. But I agree. You got the biggest thing for me. I was I was told at a 
not a young age, but a later age that, you know, keep your angles, you know, make sure fight to keep your angles. So for me, that meant like I was like diving against lefties, right? Because I was always told, you know, be, you beat a left, your lefty to left field, right? You let it get deep. And then as I got older, I actually learned you're better off like kind of what you said. You're better off almost getting the ball out in front and trying to hook the ball, especially those sliders, because you, you can catch them before they break. And that's why it would lead to what you said, pulling off the ball a little bit. So I get it. But from what I've seen, yep. you, you look like you can hit righty or lefty. So just stick with it. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely, I mean, it's a constant battle. You guys know the daily grind of of going into the, the field and maybe not feeling the same every single day. So it's a constant battle. But I think uh, learning how big approach is and how big um, staying through the, the middle of the field for me at least uh, helps me out. So um, just kind of understanding that, I think no matter who's who's on the mound, it's it's always going to you know, help, help in a little way. Hitting's hard. I'm not saying I'm going to get a hit, but um, at least give me a better chance. You got, uh, you said, what, two weeks before you go down to Florida? Yep. Yeah, exactly. You do, what's the, what's the most fun thing you've done this, this off season, or do you have anything planned before in these next two weeks before you kind of go? Nothing planned. Um, let's see. I went to, uh, I went to Monterey, California. Went and played uh, golf, Pebble Beach, and Spyglass. Um, that should be your first so answer was, right away. That was pretty sick. Uh, that's the only thing. That's the only thing I did this this off season. Really, um, tried to stay home more. I uh, didn't didn't go out too much, and um, yeah. But, but pe playing Pebble was unbelievable. I shot terrible, um, but really, honestly, after every single swing I took, I didn't care where the ball went. I was literally watching. The, the scenic view of the ocean and the waves rolling in. We got rained on, so it was one of those cool pebble days. You know, you see the sun, and then you see rain, and you see wind, and so I got it all that day. I, I was kind of with you. I played uh, one of my worst rounds at pebble. The one time, we had perfect weather. Everything was going great, and I got, like, the yips on the front nine. And it's you build up that, that pebble round to be so much that you want to play so well, and it was the worst time, and it's just still impossible not to enjoy yourself with that scenery. And uh, yeah. that being said, I, I didn't go to the back nine with my own putter because it didn't make it through the first, the front <laughs> nine. So uh, fortunately, fortunately for me, Pebble sells putters, new putters in the, yep. the clubhouse, but it's a beautiful place and a gorgeous place. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. That's actually, that's my second time going there. Um, I played spyglass two years ago. I didn't get on Pebble. Um, and this year we uh, we were able to get onto Pebble and then play Spyglass a couple of days later. So it was uh, it was a cool cool little trip for sure. It's usually the time when AJ's like, "Oh, my fifth time at Pebble." I never been to Pebble. Michael Jordan was like, "Hey, dude, you're in my wow. way." And Ken Griffey Jr. was like, blah, blah, blah. "Never been to Pebble." Wow, never been there. I'm shocked. It's too far. No, it's not. It's too far. Dude, it's far from here. What, it's worth hours? it. It's worth it. Uh, yeah. I mean, no, I'll get out there know, eventually. Obviously, I'll get out there. I just haven't. I mean, every time I'm out in the Bay Area, you know, you're locked in on the A's and the A's and the Giants. Yeah, that's fair. Oh. Well, yeah. Nolan, great to see you, man. We appreciate the time. Um, thanks for checking out the show, obviously, and we'll see you in Jupiter. I'm going to bring AJ with me. Make now, sure, so make can... sure Lance takes you out to dinner a yes. couple times in Jupiter, and make sure he takes you to play golf more than once. All right, I'll do that. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course. Thanks, Nolan. Cheers, <laughs> man. Nolan Gorman, St. Louis Cardinals, big, big power over at the second base position. Yep. Yeah, Lance is going to be good for that team. Obviously, you want him to pitch well, too. He's got to bounce back from last year, but I think he just brings a little, little swag mm -hmm. that they probably feel like they were missing as a ball club last year. Because even, for example, he's I mean, what? He's similar to how Ken described Turner. You have, you have an adult walking in there. He might be funny as hell like Lance is, but you have an adult kind of a veteran who's going to walk in there and uh, that just tightens everything up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I think well, some of their guys are pretty them, quiet too. What? They're bringing in three of them though. Sonny, yeah. him, and Gibson. And they're bringing Carpenter back, which makes me laugh. A lot of guys that are pretty loud that talk a lot in a good way, I'm saying, no? Yeah. Well, Lance for sure. Because they, they had a pretty quiet team. Edmund's very quiet. Mm -hmm. Goldie's very quiet. Arenado's pretty quiet yeah. unless obviously you piss him off on the field, then he'll kick your ass. But there's a lot of dudes that are on the quieter side, no? Mm -hmm. 
Yep. They're not walking Harp, in the clubhouse Harp. going, let's go, boys, because we fuck them up today, right? No. That's Lance. Harp, Harp's an honorary uh, favorite player of mine and always will be. Why? Because we signed deals similar to each other. He signed his first, and Cleveland had an offer to me that was, like, way below. And I think I was in a position to ask for, like, Carp's deal or above that. And right when Carp signed his deal, Cleveland's like, yeah, we know you're not going to take this anymore. So Carp probably made me a good amount of money, the fact that he got a higher value. So I always just hold him in high esteem. Wow. Does he know this? I, I was, I mean, you're like not allowed to, or I was, I was ready to send him like a flower basket over to his clubhouse for it. Hmm. Wow. Just That's a fun, fun side story. On, Cause we, so we can talk. Don't you have his number? I, I mean, I used to, he's probably changed it now. He's a Yankee star now, you know? I mean, he's I now a Cardinal. He should have the number exactly. back. Exactly. I, I can, <laughs> I can, let's just say I can get a hold of him if I need to. Okay. Yeah. I'm surprised we haven't had him on. Yeah. He's a good interview. Yeah. He yeah. Is. Yes. Some some people, Northside Geo, who's always in the chat, was like, hey, you've had a lot of Cardinals and he was throwing one other team out there lately. I'm like, yeah, well, we reach out to them. Some of them are just DMs and the Cardinals respond. They're cool. Yeah. Gorman's watching the Carp's show. Carp's not cool, though. Brendan Den- Donovan's watching Carp, the show. Carp will big league us. We got a better chance of getting on freaking, uh, I don't know, than Stan Carp. Musial than Carp at this point. Stop. Pokemon. <laughs> Who is the other? Who's the other team? Oh, he said Brewers, Brewers and Cardinals. Well, we always I mean, the Brewers have personalities always. So yeah. there's, there's Rowdy's not on the Brewers anymore. We, he's a pyro. We get him on. Yeah. Also, for example, Tyler O'Neill was on the Cardinals. He is now a Boston Red Sox. True. So if you actually and he was great math, too. He, he'll grab you by your neck and he also will you kick too. your ass. Exactly. So it's actually not as many Cardinals as you think. Former Cardinals, yes. So just throwing that out there. Uh, we're about to talk to Nathaniel Lowe, by the way. If you are in the chat and you have a question for him, maybe we will ask it. I'll check it out. I'm trying to hop back in the chat a little bit uh, when he joins us. So that's coming up in just a minute. Also, we'll still break down the uh, Justin Turner signing of our own. But let's bring him in right now. Nathaniel Lowe, the World Series winner, joining us right now to finish up his offseason. Nathaniel, Look what's up, smile. dude? Are you still smiling? You should be, right? <laughs> Look at that I mean, smile. Why, why wouldn't you, you know? Why wouldn't you? You're world <laughs> champ. True. We've also had a good run of mustaches the last couple, we last have. year or four we days. Have. Look at that thing. Oh, good that deal. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. You know, I'll see if I get it in the light and show it to you. I don't know. Is that grainy? Or can you see it? No, we got it. We got it. It looks great. All right, dude. So good first deal. off, I mean, we haven't spoken to you since. We, I don't think we've, we haven't had you on this show. And of course, we haven't spoken to you since you officially won a World Series title. So take us through what that's been like over the last few months from, boom, last out, partying, enjoying things, probably doing some meet and greets and the whole deal. What's this been like? Some meet and greets. Um, no, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Yeah. I don't know. It was, it was such a blur. And then now at this point here, we're like, I'm, I'm getting my rental house packed up and I'm, I'm getting back to Texas for a couple of days before I go back out to camp. Like it, it feels like I just unpacked all my stuff like three weeks ago here. Um, it's crazy how fast the winter's gone, but like, uh, I mean, people are just so happy. The reception's been amazing. Like, whenever I go back to Texas and, and hang out there or, or work out or what have you, um, people are just genuinely so happy. And you, know, you get stopped everywhere. And I would have never thought that I'd be in a position like that, you know. But people are happy at the grocery store. Like, I'm walking my dog down the street, and they're stopping me saying hi. It's It's been a really special, like, really special experience. And all everybody around the DFW is just, like, genuinely happy that's good that's good all right so i have three kind of rapid fires for you one nathaniel or nate which one is it uh nathaniel's official everyone calls me nate so which one do you prefer us to call you no not at all Uh, you make my mom happy by calling me nathaniel but everyone calls me nate so okay yeah okay let's go nathaniel okay we'll go nathaniel we always want to make mom happy all right (laughs) second of all i see your dog in the background is that a husky and what's oh oh my boy uh it's a german shepherd yeah he's six months old he's a baby he's a trip man oh what is there do you have two dogs or just one yeah there's two of them there's another one uh sitting over there in the corner yeah so uh yeah my girlfriend's Starting a new job this week in Texas, so I'm double dog dad this week. So packing up the house, Ooh. playing double dog dad has been great. Oh, all right. And the third <laughs> thing for me, I see your cowbell. I know you went to state, so yeah. talk to me. Because my daughter's going there next year to play volleyball. So Oh, she's going to gonna love it. She's going to love it. Yeah, Starkville was awesome. The the people there, like, 
just love sports. They love the athletes. You know, there's not, not a whole ton else to do in Mississippi, but the year that I, the year that I spent in Starkville was amazing. Um, I, I got to intertwine with some awesome players and have a really good experience for my development. So I, I, I really cherish that place. Who was your coach there? John Cohen. It was John Cohen. That was my coach at Kentucky for, uh, uh, about half a two two sem- two and a half semesters before he said I was no longer welcome on the team, um, <laughs> and I have I got a good, but I got back on with walk on tryouts the next year, and then nice. uh, John Cohn repeated what he said the first time and said I'm off the team for a second time. So uh, Starkville <laughs> was one of the best times. We don't need to get into that stuff. Starkville was one of the best places to play, though. That's probably one of the best college baseball atmospheres you can get with. Uh, do they still have all like the weird designs in the outfield of people sitting on top of trucks and the beach houses and all that? So they've they updated rid of that? They've, they've modernized oh. everything. I actually played, I don't know if it was my year or the next year was the last year that the left field lounge was all like, uh, uh, guys, like if you don't know what he's talking about, it is cinder blocks zip tied together with like a two by four and a, a, a lawn chair at the top of a piece of plywood. And there's just hundreds of them together out in the outfield and they call them rigs and they're on these wheels and they set them up the week before the season. And I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on until the the very first game, you know, you, you know, tailgates and SEC and X, Y, Z, but these people just tailgate for baseball and really love it. Like they're out there at noon for a seven o'clock game and giving food away, giving food to other players, you know, they're tossing beers over the, over the thing here and there and, and they're really out there to have a good time and enjoy it. So the left field lounge uh, is looks different now, but I mean, it's still there, but it's not the same left field lounge that you remember. Well, that's unfortunate because uh, this was my freshman year at Kentucky when I played left field. So I was by all of it. They're grilling out there. Everyone has solo cups. Um, I'm going to date myself with this story right now for you, where I think it was around the first year's Facebook came out. This is when, you put your phone number on there. You put like everything, your contacts. I didn't, I couldn't even remember if I put it out there, but I get there. It's probably the third inning. And they're like, Hey, Kibnis. They're like, is your number eight, four, like seven, three, like, and it just goes my whole cell phone number. And I'm just like, Oh shit. And I put my head down. Like I nod. And this is when you had your, like people had phones like in their, you had them off or something. They're in your bags. Cause they just, you didn't leave them in the locker room or something. And they're like, go back and check it. And I go and run. I like, kind of sneakily reach under to check the phone and I have like 20 texts, maybe 17 missed calls and all that stuff. And I give them like a thumbs up from the dugout. They're cheering. And so I'm like, okay, I'll play, I'll play along. I smile back at them. I catch the last out of the next inning. Then this one girl with the, that damn cowbell is like ringing in. She's like, woo, like just go camp, all this stuff. Catch the last out. I throw her the ball, catch it. I start running back in. This ball comes firing right by my ear. And I see probably the boyfriend right next to her in a follow through. Uh, and like I said, that's the last time I interact with that left field crowd. So, yeah. Um, but I'm going to yeah, transfer. That's... Yeah, it, it's wild. Hold on, hold on I, kid. I'm, before, I'm before, telling... hold on, kid. Before you go to the next thing, I got to ask Do you own one of the condos in left field? Because now in left field, they literally have condos. They have like no, 20 condos really in left don't. field. No, it's, it's a good setup, though. I'll tell you what. I got the, um, I got the whole tour. Coach Cohen actually took time to, uh, when he was the AD there, give me the whole tour of the new stadium. And I mean, I can't believe it's a college stadium. Dude. Like it's, it's nicer than majority of AAA stadiums. It's, it's amazing. Cause da- I think Dak has one. Dak has one up there. So, I mean, I figured, you know, your world cha- you've won more championships than Dak has. I mean, I figured it might be time for you to buy one of those condos. No, no. I don't know what I'd do in Starkville, Mississippi now, you know. It was great while I was in school, but no. Uh, that's, that's, so, that's so great. John Cohen gave you a tour. He sounds like a nice guy. Um, gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get away from baseball just for a second because I'm going, uh, I was going through your Instagram account. You are oh, nice. a little bit of a photographer. And, and I mean that yeah. as, a, as, a, as a compliment and as someone who is, yeah, if we can show some, you've taken some fantastic pictures. And as someone who's about to go on a, a long trip and uh, trying to take pictures such as that, is this, this can't be iPhone, is it? No, no. Um, yeah, that golf shot, that's at, um, that's at Pelican Hill in L.A. That's Drew Butera right there. Um, hey. Yeah, oh. that, was, uh, that was shot with a Sony. So I shot... 
I shot on Sony for a little while and then I, I upgraded to the, uh, the Leica and I, you know, I, it's not the camera, like they're all going to do something similar. Uh, I just wanted a point and shoot instead of having something that I would have to drag around with the big, you know, the big zoom to it. Um, but yeah, since I, since I've switched over to shooting like a, like the, I'd love to tell you that I do manual focus and mess with all the settings and all the stuff that the pros do. But honestly, the, uh, the autofocus is so much smarter than me that I just, I just hit the button when I see something I like and, and it usually turns out pretty solid, but you know, so like is the way to go. Anything. Yeah. Like us are awesome. Like, is there okay, awesome? uh, you answered my question, and you we apparently have the same eye where autofocus will work for both of us. So, but yes, uh, keep going because those are some great pictures that you posted up there. Thank you. Yeah, get to your Q three, and and you'll love it. Done. Done. Do you know who the famous former players are that are photogs? Uh, I know King Griffey Junior's around. I know Randy Johnson's around. Um, Boom. Howie Kendrick, I know he shoots Leica. Like it's there's a there's a pretty good pretty good group of guys that are into that. So I, it's pretty cool. Gr- I, I Griffey really used to it. do it. Griffey started because he didn't want to be bothered at his kids' game, so that's why he started. True no story. way. Yeah, that's why. He, I mean, Randy Johnson just didn't like to talk to anybody, so that's why he did it. But Griffey, <laughs> so Griffey did. would sit in the seats, and everyone's coming up to him. Yeah. So he said, "No, I'm going to go out in the outfield or on the field and take pictures, and that way nobody would put his headphones in and nobody would bother him." Wow. I didn't it was know very, that. actually smart. If you, I mean, if you're Ken Griffey Jr. Yeah. People, Did he fall yeah, in love so, with doing it? Yeah. Now he loves I can it. Actually, yeah. I can actually add to that story. Um, when I bought my Sony, the guy at the camera shop downtown Orlando was like, yeah, you know, um, Ken Griffey Jr. comes in here and buys his cameras in here. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll save my breath and not try and tell you that I'm, you know, a double A AA player and trying to make it one day to the pros and all that stuff. But yeah, so we stood in the same store. Wait, did you play you played at Disney? No, no. I, I live in Orlando for the winter. You do wait, what? You do? Yeah. Yeah. Well why are you not here then? Studio AJ. Are you guys in studio? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know what, Scott? If you would have called David, like if if, if Scott would have called David and looped him into there, we could have done this lot. But you know who's, what? Wait, who's <laughs> David? David Meter. Oh, oh you're my a God! Guy? Yeah. Oh, I didn't oh. even put all the math yeah, together. Scott, Damn Scott's it. sick. Scott, Scott has mucus yeah. in his head. So wait, okay. So well, yeah. Now, well, now, wait. When do you leave for spring training? Uh, Sunday. Oh shit! I was going to say we could go play golf, but nope. Not the good news is this I'd show's not to, going I'd anywhere. I'd love to, but my truck got shipped out today, and yeah. And and here's the worst part: is that I'm definitely still trying to find some time to get out to the golf course, uh, especially now that it's sunny. And my brother's like, uh, yeah, these new T100 Titleist irons that I got, um, no shot. You you can play with my old P790 <laughs> wait, wait, what? launchers. <laughs> what area of Orlando? Just give me the area that do you live in. Winter Garden. What? That's like right here. I know. Yeah. I know. All I'm right. So right next up, off I'm right up the road. Jeez. Yeah. Why do you tell me these things, Scott? Me? I'm not locked in on everybody's <laughs> addresses and uh, agencies. Geez. <laughs> next time we, we got it all this is why we do this we do the connections right on the show yeah, now yeah next, next off up. season you're screwed we're gonna have you over here like twice a week <laughs> i'm in, you're gonna I'm be in. Here. i would love you're to. gonna be here more than scott is thank god that's fine you can take over today <laughs> you can host the rest of the show all right i got a couple well, no hold on now now we're having orlando talk all right uh, winter garden yeah. what's your favorite spot the crooked can i knew you'd say that i, I mean I yeah i take the dog out there we sit out there and have a pizza and have a pop or two and yeah, it's a nice it's a nice afternoon. It is whole enchilada, the whole area down there is nice. Yeah. Scott's never oh, been yeah. there. Scott's never been down there. He you don't know that. that. We got to break him in. You don't know my life. We gotta yeah, he, he he won't. He he's a downtown I am guy. A downtown he's a, guy. He's a downtown. He wants the high rises uh, and the foofy yeah. restaurants. I come from New York City. I like the yeah. Lake Eola, wow. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a Lake he lives right next to Lake Eola. <laughs> I, do. I, I bet do. he does. <laughs> nice stroll. He doesn't on Lake understand Eola. like how redneck Winter Garden is. I don't. Hey, I don't great. know much about Winter Garden. It's great. My mom's There's... coming this weekend. I can take her. Is that a good yeah, spot? Yeah. Once you get past, once you get out past me, like Claremont, Mineola, like man, I, I went to JUCO in Palatka. Um, oh yeah. You see some trucks with the Palatka lean going on, you know, where you got the uh, the six inch kid on the front and two and a half on the back, and it looks like they're you know crawling along the road like that. That's like that's all over the place around here. Such a Florida conversation. 
I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to take us out. Let's go to a I Texas mean, dude, he went, he went from Palatka to Stark Vegas. Yeah, I mean, talk deep. about some trucks now. Hey, I went, to, I went to Mercer University in Macon, Georgia first. So I saw, I saw some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some things. All I right, back to stuff. Rangers. So yes, first Rangers, off, yeah. Th- before the season started, were you like, hey, this team can win a World Series for real? Because obviously, I think the narrative around the Rangers was, most people said, I really like what they're doing. It's a nice young core and more along the way. And you got some of the superstars that were signed to add to the table, right? Over the last few years, like a Semyon and a Seager to join you guys. And obviously you were traded over from Tampa Bay. But did you feel like the team was one year away? Or were you like, I actually think people are overlooking us. Uh, I know. I remember like trying to tell myself before spring training not to get ahead of myself because like I expected that group to win like I really did and you know uh they spend half a billion dollars on on Corey and Marcus and then bring in John Gray Martin Perez has a great year in 22 and then you know got a couple other pieces that were starting to get heading in the right direction and then to see when the front office committed to Jacob deGrom for five years and then Evaldi and Heaney and all the guys that are in-house that wound up playing the roles they played it was like damn, we could actually do this thing. Like, you know, and nobody knows they're going to actually win the World Series until they're actually winning the World Series. But all you want is a chance to compete. And we had a group that really could compete. And I I would be very surprised if we're not in a similar position coming down the stretch this year. So is this team cornering the market on legendary starters? So you've got Max coming back again. Obviously, he was part of the team last year. But midseason, DeGrom's going to come back at some point. It looks like maybe July or August. Everyone's been talking about this could be the year Kershaw decides, all right, I'll spend some time with, you know, Max and Jacob and and the World Series champs. So what do you think? I don't know. Are we going to live in a world where Clayton Kershaw is not a Dodger? You know, it's 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 crazy to think, but it gets talked about every year. Yeah, yeah. The hometown hometown guy, the Highland Park legend coming back to pitch for the Rangers would be amazing. Um, You know, but I. I trust the guys we have in-house too. I think that uh, I think that we're going to have some really, really strong performances from some guys who might not have had the years that they wanted to have last year and maybe might not be on the same level as, you know, Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer, but we got really good pitchers that are looking for some success. And, you know, now that the group's comfortable because you, you guys have been a part of winning teams before, the culture's so important and we round up just round up the guys that we round up and we wound up with a really good group. Like we just, so we, it was easy to come to work. Actually, it's funny. No, put, put AJ on here too. Cause I was just going to ask the question and we're talking in the chat while we're talking to you. I wanted to ask about the same person. I was going to ask if he's real. I mean, we had him on the show, but for his thoughts on Evan, Evan Carter. Yeah. yeah. He has no idea how good he could be. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Go on. No idea. Yeah. It's just like, you know, um, his whole routine, it's not, he's not one of those guys that's doing like a ton of weight in the weight room. And he's not like, you know, how you have some guys who just are anti weights and do all the movements and kind of stuff too. Like he sticks to his own plan. I feel like, and I've seen some of the stuff he does and, you know, I like the kids 21 and, and, and I was 21, I was definitely in no spot to be able to contribute to a world series World Series run. So for him just to kind of roll in and then, um, you know, be the contributor that he is and have the success that he had, like, you know, that that right there is just like, oh, yeah, I got a, I got a cutter in, I hit it to right. And all of a sudden it winds up going over the fence and, you know, we score some runs for the good guys in a postseason run. So it's cool that he's that simple um, because I guess it really keeps him, like, in a good headspace. But that dude can play, man. I'm really excited to see what he could do with 162 game series or season. Sorry. A good culture that helps everything that helps rookies who can come up. And if they're having so much fun that they're not stressed about the, the their first game or the new day or whatever the, the challenge may be, that helps rookies really come out of their shell and kind of become the best version of themselves. Yes. Yes. Oh, another right? piece on Evan too in Cleveland. Um, his locker was next to mine. And like the very first time that he used his ID, um, we were going to casino, right? Cause the guys are hanging out X, Y, Z. 
And he looks at me the next day. He's like, dude, I, I got a problem. I'm like, all right, Evan, like, what's, what's going on? He's like, these are my, these are my last sliders and they have a hole in them. Like, what, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm like, dude, there, there's an equipment manager that, you know, gets his uh, salary paid to make sure that you have your yeah. stuff. It's like, it's going to be okay. So yeah. They'll take it out of your next check. Dude, yeah, Brandon, tell, tell Brandon, hey, tell Brandon and the boys, they got to clean it up a little bit. Dude. I know, right? You got Evan Carter not having holes in his slider, but tell <laughs> Brandon to clean it up. I'll get on him. Don't worry. Yeah, man, I'm going to text him right now and be like, man, you let Evan, your three hole hitter, have holes in his slider? You guys have changed over the years. <laughs> they're they're nah, lucky they sliders. They do a good job. They do a good job. Hey, Nathaniel, I got one more for you. Did the sure. Rays mess up? By trading you because they've made a lot of very shrewd moves over the years and i'm looking back it's been a few years now none of the dudes that you got dealt for have made much noise yet and you've made a lot of noise over the last few years usually the whole joke is raise call hang up they know something blah 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 i think they messed up <laughs> i don't know man that's that's above my pay grade i can't <laughs> can't say <laughs> one answer. way or the other you know but i'm always gonna air on the side of uh you know believing in what i'm doing so I, i'm in texas for a reason and enjoying the success that i'm having for a reason and you know who's to say who's to say i would have had the same track if i stayed in tampa you know I, you see so many guys over there with the matchups and the platoons and all that kind of stuff and and maybe if your split isn't good enough on one side then all of a sudden you're missing out on a, a couple hundred at bats 70 or 80 at bats and who's to say you can't pump seven or eight homers in those 70 70 or 80 at bats so all of a sudden your season changes dramatically um but no i i i love where i'm at right now i loved coming up through that system like the people were so amazing and now it's it's cool to see the internal hires getting brought up to the big league staff wise and then the players that um players that were kicking around in a ball and short season while i was you know, in and out of the big leagues there, come up and really start to have an impact on the team. So they got a good thing going on over there, but uh, I'm very happy where I'm at now. I'm sure. You know why the Rays had to trade you, though? They had too many lows. They yeah, had you, yeah. Low, low, had your brother Josh, and they had Brandon Lowe. I wow. mean, Brandon Lowe, I know, dumbass. Okay, <laughs> Joe Buck, they had too Joe many Buck guys said, with the same name. Joe Buck said Brandon Lowe when he made the all-star team, so I, I'm I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask this question, and my producer on Fox is going to kill me for telling. So we did a game in 21 after yeah. the COVID year, and you hit yeah. a home – you came up to hit, and our producer goes, and we got this guy hitting a home run in the World Series last year, and it was Brandon Lau, and he ran the video. And we're like, no! And we're like, that's not the same guy. And you're up there batting, and we're like, that's not Brandon Lau. It was, and it just happened to be you because he saw the name. He's like, oh, this guy went off in the World Series. We're like, that's the wrong – oh, too late. He looks Pretty taller. Awesome. Yeah, nobody Man. talk about it. We'll just act like it didn't yeah, happen. He looks taller, is yeah. right? <laughs> Better mustache. Man. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, they. So they the, showed man, some nice loud. They showed Brandon Lau going deep, like in the World Series. Wow. And Nathaniel Lowe comes walking up there, and we're like, "That's not there's, the same." There's guy. probably Nathaniel. There's <laughs> no, probably Nathaniel, some casual Nathaniel baseball Lowe was fan at that thinks you had a series. day. What's up? Nathaniel Lowe was at that World Series, but he was off the roster and in a suite um, eating a hot dog. I think we did those like. <laughs> the boomstick dogs that they have in Texas and yeah. got those put in the suite for the players. Cause we were still in the bubble. Right. And uh, yeah, we put a couple of those away. Had a was, good time. I was at that world series. I got COVID at that world series game. Six. Oh, nice. Justin Turner gave me a high five and I got COVID. We're about to oh. talk about it. He just signed. Oh, I'm so. just kidding. I know. I, but yeah, I was, that was, I was at game six. It was great. I was there. It was awesome. It was awesome. Game. Yeah. And well, right up until they took Blake sell out. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ah, yeah, we were yelling from the suite. We were yelling from the suite, voicing our displeasure. It's so funny, too. You know, I, like, you asked Corey. I've asked Corey about that. And, of course, he says the same thing everybody else in the baseball world was thinking. Like, it doesn't matter who you're facing after facing Blake Snell when he's got his A stuff and cutting him up two times through. You know, you could have brought in the next best thing, and it didn't matter. It wasn't Blake Snell, so it was going to swing momentum for them. But – that's the move that the move that we have to live with. I, you know. I, I, I want to know because I, I've always wondered this, and you were there. You were I know you weren't in the dugout, but but it, okay. Let's say the Rays, you guys win that world, you win Game Six of that World Series. What happens in Game Seven? Is it delayed? Because remember that was when everyone was scared to death of COVID, right? 
So then it comes out that JT pops positive for COVID. Would they have delayed the World Series like two weeks to make sure everybody was clear? Or would they just been like, oh, wait, we're just kidding. Justin Turner didn't have COVID. We're just going to go ahead and play. I know, right? I don't know. I like to think that uh, maybe they would have cut everybody and just let the uh, the taxi squad get activated and maybe put <laughs> some coaches, coaches and clubbies in there. You know, you get number 74 versus number 62 and your visiting clubby for the World Series title. Um, that would have been pretty fitting. <laughs> <laughs> like the movie replacements like he's yeah. got a van and he's driving down the street in arlington like hey you you play baseball yeah. come on hey, you played in high school <laughs> right it. let's go you're a left fielder <laughs> yes well nathaniel it's great to talk to you on here for the first time obviously good to learn that you're nearby so we'll grab you next off season and uh thanks for joining us man keep smiling awesome guys thank you for having me on thank good luck, you it's great Nathaniel Lowe of the uh, Texas Rangers, the World Series champs. I didn't put all the math good, together, but good dude. He seems easy to root for. I like him. He's great. Yeah, for sure. He yeah, is. he's, he's awesome. a great interview. And he lives in great. I mean, he lives I in mean, God's country. I mean, what do you expect? He he lives in the best area on the planet, right? I mean, it's very close to yeah. you. Yeah, AJ's very excited about getting deep on the Orlando talk. Mm. Uh, let's let's but keep yeah, going you know on the Rangers. Been, you know, it's been a great day today. What we've had a lot of golf talk. We've had Orlando talk. The only thing we're missing is the NFL. You want to do a world, uh, Super Bowl breakdown for the next two, uh, big game? We got two breakdown. weeks. I'm not allowed to say Super Bowl. You have to say the big game. Okay. Well, I said it, Subi. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's go over the Rangers, though, for a sec. Your BetMGM World Series odds. So, do you know what they were at heading into the season? We're about to show it. Plus 5,000. Mm. Somebody threw down on the Rangers and was like, I feel like this team's got some talent. Plus 5,000. And then, of course, by. July, it was pretty evident that they were a pretty good ball club. They were in first place. They were at 52 and 39. They were scoring a ton. Houston was trailing by two games in the division. And then entering the playoffs, Kip, they were at plus 1,800. Right now, they're at plus 1,100. The only thing I'll caution, because you do it every year, is that we just haven't seen back to back champs. So it's so rare to see. I will double down, though, and say if there's a team that could do it, it might be them. They've got a pretty good farm system of young talent coming through. Then they have like a whole shift change of starting pitchers that could come through in August. I was going to say, that's good value. And they got out to the real fast start, didn't they, last year? They were one of the – they yes. were mm-hmm. they jumped out to a huge lead, so that's why you see it go down much. But um, you never know. With those two big – those big donkeys at the top of that rotation coming back in the middle of the season, I'm that's good value at plus 1,100 right now. Yeah. N- yeah. No? Yeah, no, I, I think it is. I think – I just think people are looking at other teams. That's just to win the World Series, right? Just World so Series. So I, I think t- people are looking at what Houston did with Hayter, and I think that they're – people are heavy on the Yankees because of Soto. Dodgers and Braves. And then I, I didn't even get to the National League. Thank yeah. you. I mean, <laughs> they're very heavy on Dodgers and Braves. So that's why I think it's – you know, 1,100 is – actually, you know, I thought it would be more like 900 ish around there but 1100 is you get some value there i just you know repeating they have a lot of injuries already we'll see uh tough division mariners are 54 percent better so we'll, we'll see <laughs> <laughs> um anyway well yeah we'll see what happens but they did lead the american league and run scored last year so it's not just the pitching the offense was great if anything i mean they had david robertson but on the starting pitching side they keep calling for Jordan Montgomery's return. He was such a big part of that World Series winning team. And he was the biggest trade addition last year. So he's still hanging out. He will sign soon, presumably. All right, BetMGM Sportsbook account holders who create an entry in our BetMGM Million Dollar Playoff Football Challenge. Yeah, go we got football. football in Yay, there. football. You have an opportunity to win a share of a million bucks in bonus bets if you predict the three playoff football questions correctly out of the eligible users. Each entry period has three questions. When you log into the app, you go to the promotions tab, and then you complete and submit the BetMGM Million Dollar Playoff Football Challenge entry. One entry per customer permitted per entry period. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING. All right, I'll just spend a few minutes before we get to slap hands on the Justin Turner edition. So we spoke to Ken about it, but let's get your thoughts on it first. Are the Blue Jays better? Is this similar to the Diamondbacks adding Jock Peterson, where a lot of fans are looking around wanting Jorge Soler and J.D. Martinez, and you're getting the next tier down? Because those two are, are at the top tier of yeah. like your DH type, right? 
I just think they didn't want to lock themselves in. I think J- Justin can still play some infield if he's needed to. Yeah. I mean, he can a day or a day a week or something like sure. he's mainly a DH, but I also think, you know, the, the Blue Jays said we had special money for Otani and then everyone else. And they've kind of, you've kind of seen that filter down. I think they're counting on a big be- bounce back here from Vlad. Bouchette, stay healthy. Springer, right? Kiermaier, IKF to take over for Wit. Alejandro Kirk bounces back. They're hoping Manoa hopefully is in shape and bounces back. Um, are they better than what they were this time last year? I think they're about the same, honestly. I think it's it's about the same. But are, do they have enough to overtake Yankees? Baltimore? Probably not, right? It's close. I love their to me, they're still probably a wild card E team. They're not a they're not an AL East winning team without addition of one more, as Ken said, big left handed bat. Unfortunately, that guy's named Cody Bellinger, and they're probably not going to pay for him. Mm -hmm. And Kip, they lost Matt Chapman. I mean, unless he resigns, but I don't know. It seems like he could be heading to, say, a San Francisco or maybe a Chicago. I think he's going to sign with the Giants. Chapman. I won't say they're much better just because I think Chapman versus Turner or something. Chapman plays every day in a pretty damn good third third base. Um, but I think with the bounce back and then you add the tutelage coming from Turner, that's going to really help uh, these kind of year three, year four guys really take the next step, hopefully. Okay. I mean, I, listen, I, I like this. I do. I mean, Lou Marloni chiming in. He saw JT last year in Boston. You want right? to read it? Because I'm running out of words. <laughs> oh my god okay i'll take over Hosting. something has been broken in toronto for a few years now too much talent to not be a serious contender in the american league rotation is one of the best adding turner was a great move great presence in a clubhouse that needs one lou merloni and boba shat was on a show recently too where he mentioned justin turner's name as someone that he'd like to see added to the well, clubhouse his wish. do we feel like they have a clubhouse problem though i don't think it's a clubhouse problem it's just the offense not living up to its potential. I don't think there's like drama going on with the Blue Jays. I think that's yeah, the, the clubhouse problem. problem is they're not winning enough. Yeah, that's the problem. That's it's not a a character issue by any means, or at least from any people talking. It doesn't sound that way. I think it's just they were underperforming. That that is the problem. They they know they have good players there, and they want to see them kind of reach that potential, but they need them to uh, reach it to get to where they want to go. It's not just they kind of are one of those teams with these kind of guys. It's almost like a low floor, high ceiling team. I think and that's it's not one of those ones that you count that even if they have bad years that these this team's still going to win 90 games. This team could win 75 games or they could win 100. So I think it's just they have one of those ones where it's a lot of variables but they really do have people in there to to be good. 100 might be a stretch because I don't think they have that kind of Maybe in that division, maybe yeah, maybe in that, division that division with the Orioles and yeah, the Yankees. Yeah. It's it's that's Again, tough. Yeah, it's that it's division. tough. And the Rays, let's not forget. I mean, that's the I mean, so, so think about it. last year you had the Rays, the Orioles, the Blue Jays made the playoffs, right? Right. The Yankees didn't even make the playoffs last year, and they're going to be better, you would think. I think they're going to make the playoffs. Okay. So then is there four teams out of that division going to make the playoffs? Because we're already assuming the Orioles are going to be equally good. There's one team out of the AL Central. You can already book that. Of course. Okay. So that means four out of the East and only one out of the West? That seems like a no, big not necessarily. tough pull. I think two out of the West and three out of the East again? I agree. Okay. So who are the four is going to miss out? Baltimore. <laughs> maybe, wow. Maybe. You heard or, it here first, people. Scott Braun hates the Orioles. There Baltimore it is. Baltimore or Toronto. Over the Rays. Oh, no, I got the Rays out. I got the you Rays did, out. Nope, you said Baltimore. Kip, you heard it. Wait, he hates the Orioles. Let's re rack He hates the Orioles. I got he Baltimore, Baltimore, New York, Citizens. and Toronto. I got the Rays out okay. this year. I think they'll take a step back. I, I don't love the pitching. They're missing a lot of their pitching. They always seem to be, and they always seem to and figure it out. They grow them on trees, but yeah. it's true. I mean, for me, you look at the Blue Jays, and they were pretty healthy last year. That's the other thing. Mm-hmm. Variables change year to year. I mean, Alec Manoa was just out of shape, apparently. Alec Manoa had obviously a disaster season. But look, look at the other core four in that rotation last year. I think they made all their starts. Barrios, Osman. Bassett, who am I missing? And Ryu came back later in the season. Uh, missing the one. lefty they brought in in the playoff game. Uh, uh, Kikuchi. Kikuchi. And then Bo. Bo got hurt a little. He got a dinged. Little. Remember he dinged his knee? Yeah. Vladdy. Most Vladdy had healthy. a down year, though. That's he had a down year, right? And Springer. Chapman didn't have a great injuries. year. We talked about it. He had a great first month. Yeah. 
kind of carried the team though in the first month. Yeah, Kirk had a down year. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it's gonna. They're a fascinating team to me because they have all the money in the world. Kip, you know, you've been to Toronto. They have all the money in the world. They can do whatever they want. Um, but they just don't seem to ever get the big. I mean, I guess they did when they got Springer, right? It was a big splash. Gosman was a big splash. Yeah, Springer's great. Same thing. I mean, definitely injury concerns there. We've dealt with That's that. That's why it's just confusing to me. It, uh, it's just confusing to me. If you're going to be in on Shohei, how is Bellinger's not – how is his cost too much now, or however they want to word it? Separating marketing from performance. Mm -hmm. They were 100%. like, we will make a fortune off him. That's a publicly traded company, I, too. I, yeah. But I'm talking if you're – if okay, even if you prorate it down to maybe what it would be, I think Bellinger checks every box you're looking for. Outfield help, lefty bat help, big name. I think he brings in the market a little bit. He moves the needle just a little. Obviously, nowhere near the – the movement of a Shohei, but I just think he's a perfect fit for there. And I'm hoping they're making that splash still probably won't yeah. happen, but I hope they do. I, I agree. I think he'd be a great fit there. I think they do what most other teams do. I mean, it sounds like a broken record, but it's a business first winning second. So Shohei would sell the place out every night. Does Bellinger sell the place out every night? No, no. Let me ask you this. When, why have they not, when are they going to start locking up a Vlad? I think it's too late. Like the Pete Alonso situation at this point, he's going to, why not go to free agency when you're this close? I agree. I'm just saying, I think there's a better chance of Bo, but I think Bo might want to test, test the too. waters at this point too. It, you wait this long. Have they, mm -hmm. do we know publicly that they've thrown some big number out there in the past? Well, I, mean, we, I mean, they might've, but we haven't heard a whole right. lot. Kip. I mean, oh, when you yep. get the Pete Alonso status or for Bo and Vladdy two years away instead of one, and you're that they're, freaking they're, talented. They're too close to free agency. The, the old saying is the longer you wait, the more you make. Um, when they're knocking on the door this close, especially those guys, uh, they're going to test the waters. Yeah. You have to really blow them out of the water with an offer this close to free agency for them to take it. Agree. <laughs> well, why'd they wait? <laughs> Adam in the chat goes, shut up, Kipnis. Belly's coming back to Chicago. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I don't want him here, too, in Chicago. Yeah. I'm just saying fit wise, he's perfect for Toronto. But uh, listen, he was awesome in this city. This city loves him, too, in Chicago. So uh, I would I would love to have him back in a Cubs uniform as well. I think the Cubs need him more than anybody him else, more than yeah. the Blue Jays. I think if the Cubs don't bring him back, they're not a playoff team unless there's somebody else like that. They're replacing him with. Yeah, I don't think the Cubs are a playoff team. I don't Chapman. Matt Chapman. Can you make him a playoff team? Closer. Both, both of them? Both of them, yes. I think that division is going to be tougher than most people think, especially for the for the Cubs. Just saying. I think the Reds are better. Well, the Brewers will be good again. What was that guy's name in the chat room? Told me to shut up. Adam. He's got a Cubs logo, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Adam. <laughs> Talk soon. He said he's got, he's got a, a poker game uh, with you later. He's, he's yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're kidding around, Adam. But, yeah, I mean, I would love to see it happen. We've been talking about it for a long time. Cubs definitely need to make some moves, too. We've talked about the same two teams over and over again. The Cubs and the Giants still have one or two moves left to make to show that they're the legit. Orioles. We've talked about them, too. Yeah, it's just hard to believe the Orioles are going to do anything. It's the, the year-long staring contest with the Orioles about Dylan Cease. Yep. Basically. It's true. So, all right, let's slap hands. <laughs> All right, we're going to get an instant breakdown in slap hands from Jason Kipnis on his first big league hit. We have the archives. That it, it wasn't even VHS back then. What was it? That's why you can't find mine because it was VHS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not yet. It'll happen. Uh -oh. though. Sorry, it's, it's coming soon. I've been told that it's uh, being cooked up. We so found the video. We found the video. Now it is being uploaded. I, I, couldn't, remember the, I couldn't remember the full name of Takahashi. Yep. Takanashi. Takahashi. Takahashi. And, and, I mean, you can give everyone a little teaser. Oh, here it is. Oh, Over I was 0 for 6. And it's uh, bases loaded, bottom of the ninth, exactly how you dream about it in uh, your backyard when you're coming up. Um, you're, I was 100% on deck circle being like, please, God, if there was ever a time to get my first, just let it let this be it right now. And 
You're not, you're not begging, but you're, you're, you're wishing and praying, but look at that baby face right there and all this. Wow. Uh, fun fact. Uh, I think Tory Hunter was in right field. Didn't know it was my first hit and just nonchalantly picked up the ball and threw it into the stands. Thankfully, uh, Sandy Alomar, first base coach at the time, ran and kind of chased it down and almost ran up a step or two to get it for me. So I thank Sandy mucho for that one. He was awesome. Um, and that's just – that stuff any player usually never forgets, that kind of moment. Yeah, thanks, Tori. You got to text Tori. He, yeah, do you I'm think gonna, he knows? I don't know. Have you told Tori that story? I think I think he joked about it a little bit later that he – because I, I got to know him a little bit throughout the career afterwards uh, that no, especially once you get to know him, he would have never done it had he known. So he definitely didn't know. And um, He's awesome. I actually saw him at O'Hare Airport here about uh, six months ago. So, But yeah. that's, that's, that's one of those moments, obviously – being a bottom of the ninth bases loaded walk off is, is, is a kid's dream uh, for your first hit ever. Uh, but just any player getting their first hit is just a moment that uh, what, they never forget. What year was that? 2011. Because I mean, I'm looking at that team. Brantley, I saw Brantley, Pronk, right? Well, this was Carlos the, Santana, this is the tail, the tail end of the Pronk, Sizemore, Orlando Cabrera at short. There's a oh Tribble Huff, I, Huff, he's bo- I booked Huff. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, Shelly Duncan, probably. Shelly Duncan. Donald. Yeah. Lou, Lou Jason Marston. Donald famous. What's Jason Donald famous for? Broke up the uh, Colorado's break, perfect, perfect game. Perfect game. Yep. Yeah. Lou Marson, well, you know what he did? He did it. He hit the, he, he hit the ball off of uh, Burley's legs. legs. Between Through his the legs. legs. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's some good names on that team. That's a, that's a blast from the past for the Cleveland fans here. Real quick, do you remember? Because you forget everything that happens during a season. Obviously, we do a show every day, but Pete Alonso throwing Mason Wynn's first hit into yeah, the stands. And then people got pissed. People were so mad. And then he apologized and sent him stuff and didn't yeah. know. And I think they got him the ball back anyway. Yeah, but still. Yeah. Expecting for, a you don't realize like that, no. Yeah. He's a rookie. And no, I, I never hit. thought for a second, like anything rudely, like Tori did that on purpose. No, for Pete Alonso and Tori, this was just probably another game. And. Uh, they probably had no idea, and we're just getting off the field. So, hey, Tori had a long, a long history of hating Cleveland guys. So maybe he did do it on purpose. You don't remember Danny Baez when him and Danny Baez got into uh, it? Yeah, and he threw the ball and smoked his ass. Danny Baez hit him, and Tori picked it up and smoked it. his ass. Yeah, threw it like 107 back at him. <laughs> well, Tori was one of the nicer dudes in the game, but if you until he him did, off, until he wasn't, hey, until he wasn't, <laughs> until he until wasn't. wasn't. <laughs> yeah, everybody has their line. Dude, Tori was the best. Tori. Yeah. Tori be the nicest. Dude. Hey, Tori, hey, Tori, you're my favorite. Uh, fuck that motherfucker. Oh, he get. Oh man, he get mad. It was the best, dude. He was the best. Hey, Tori, love you, Tori. <laughs> Didn't he call you once during the show? He did call me during yeah. the. Sh- it was when they said he was going to be the first base coach for the Angels. And he was like, "No, I'm not." He's like, "Hell no, I ain't going to be no first base coach." Incredible. Oh, uh, what a day we made it. So guest list tomorrow: Rowdy Telez. Kylie McDaniel from ESPN who does a great job predicting contracts, this prospect talk and all of that. We don't have a Cardinal or a Brewer. We have a Pirate and a Brave. AJ Minter will join us coming oh, off of Brave. Great Fest. name. He's got a great name. Minter? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. AJ Minter, Brock Holt back with us tomorrow. Kip, good to see you, man. Yeah, Kip, it's been a while. Likewise. Likewise, yeah. boys. We'll thanks for, thanks for fitting us into your golf schedule. <laughs> yeah right not in this state sorry it's cold at 40 yeah winter weather global I'm gonna, freezing I'm gonna go sh- yeah i'm gonna go shovel in my backyard <laughs> <laughs> uh.